Are we on? So we are, we are filming now, so welcome everybody to Children and Young People's Scrutiny Panel on the 17th of April. And a, a warm welcome to all our officers, of course, but a special warm welcome to our head teachers who've come to share some of their findings with us. Um, so without any further ado, we'll crack on with the agenda. Um, and we're going through apologies of absence. Um, I've got apologies for lateness from Councillor O'Byrne, um, but no other apologies. I strongly suspect that the early start has thrown people, but um, we'll wait and see. Um, I have no urgent business um, requiring, and I would like to ask if anybody's got any declarations of interest on matters. Thank you. And uh, looking at the minutes from the 17th of January, a um, couple of things. Um, we've got um, an attendance missing on that. Joe, we've got someone who's not noted down there, Joe, yeah. And also, at the end of the um, minutes, it says, uh, municipal year, 2023, wait a minute, 2023-24, that should read municipal year 2024-25. So we make those adjustments. And if we make those adjustments, are the panel agreed that these minutes are an accurate record? Yes, thank you. All right, I'll sign those then, yeah. All right, moving then on to item five on our agenda, which is, the, um, the review undertaken by the panel into the emotional well-being um, support available for children and young people. And first of all, I would like to thank those members of the panel that actually um, were able to visit schools, but also to thank all the schools that made us welcome and gave us some wonderful information. And our two head teachers are here to give us a, an outline of their own situation. I would like to, as well, um, draw everyone's attention to um, paragraph 7.4 on this, which I think is important to note that we... Oh, I can't find it. Wait a minute. I get the wording right. It says here, this report found that our education leaders have responded with a high degree of creativity and proactivity to these underlying challenges. Many schools have introduced a range of innovations and initiatives to address changing emotional health and well-being needs. And I would like that noted because um, we all know the challenges that um, our leaders face and we would like to commend them for that. So I would like to ask, please, if um, panel members have had a chance to read the review and um, if they're in agreement with the recommendations or if there's any matters they'd like to raise. No? No matters. Okay. So the, um, the report then is recommended to go to the overview and scrutiny panel meeting. Everyone's in agreement. Goody. That's please. So now... To support this um, report, I'd like to invite our two visiting he head teachers, um, Stuart Sharp from uh, St. Thomas More Secondary School in Eltham, and Tom Lawrence, who is from Woolwich Poly on Thamesmead. And I'm just going to hand over to you, gentlemen, to share with us um, your s situation, you know, the three, three things that you might like to, s to tell us about the challenges you face, how, how your school might be handling that, and how you might see some further support coming from us or, or coming from anywhere. But it's because a lot of the panel were unable to make visits into schools. I think there were only two of us, that could, or three of us, at any one time. So I'm just going to hand over to you, Stuart and Tom, if you'd like to share with us, yeah? Okay?
um, staff recruitment and retention, which is an underlying concern because when you teach as we do in a very socially precarious area. Oh, sorry. So when you teach as I do um, in a, a very socially precarious area uh, with uh, a lot of endemic poverty, um, a lot of in, uh, unstable homes and uh, literally in the sense of families, but also in terms of housing, um, the cracks seem to widen uh, for students to fall through. And school is one of the safety nets that we have in society. But that itself becomes a little less certain, a little less um, rigorous if you do not have the staff that you need, but also retaining the staff who've got the relationships um, and therefore the trust of the students um, to be able to sustain them while they're at school. So that probably is the most profound challenge. There is one other thing that I can't see when I, uh, when I briefly look through um, that section 7.3 that is um, particularly applicable to us in our area, and that is the safety of the streets around um, our school. Um, my distinct feeling is that from the school to Plumstead Woolwich is relatively safe, well policed in a way by society in general. The going the other way from the school towards Abbey Wood doesn't feel as safe. It doesn't feel as if it's almost under the control of authority in, in the broader sense. And when our students are coming to and from school and through that area, um, my fear is, and I genuinely think this is the case, they're coming to us not feeling in the safest of moods when they come to school. Um, so that's something where I think we could do with serious help in, in, um, in the same way as, for instance, around here, there are wardens, there is a high police presence, um, and it's had to be, um, and it's had the right effect. I feel that we need that actually more broadly um, in other areas of a borough as well, and that's one particular area of a borough that um, I think it, it is lacking in. And, and similar to that, um, police liaison officers for schools, we haven't had one now for many, many years. Um, every time we have been supported, they're taken away quite quickly because there's more need outside of schools. Uh, and that has an impact on what we can do with the students, similar to what Tom was saying. Um, for me, I've been teaching since 1994. Um, and the huge big change in that, which has seen exacerbated by COVID, is the mental health issues that are coming into school. Um, it's escalated beyond, I think, what most schools can now cope with. Um, as a result of that, we employ now a full-time counsellor. We used to employ one on three days a week before COVID, and now it's five days a week, and she's already fully booked. Um, finding a school counsellor is like hen's teeth. Um, someone who wants to come into school is really, really difficult. Um, and one of the things the panel was shown is that we have a learning support unit at the school, which is vital. And this is an area where students can go who, for whatever reason, are struggling at school. It could be behaviourally, it could be emotionally, it could be physically, because they've got broken leg. And that is now becoming so more important than it's ever been. Um, and luckily, we've got a fantastic uh, member of staff who supervises that. It's wonderful for the students. Um, but it's at time at capacity. And it's what you then do when you've got huge numbers of issues, which ones you prioritize. And then students then don't have access to the support they've got. You then look to external sources and they are all full. So the mental health support team that is wonderful are at capacity, CAMS is at capacity. All those resources that schools rely on are are at capacity as well and, and therefore you look internally and there's only so much you can do there because like Tom said you can't find the staff um, or the good staff that you yes. actually require <laughs> yeah. you can find certain staff but the, again it's about relationships that you need um, but they're so important it's it's the, the, those bases where students can go especially students who struggle to come to school to know there's that safe mm. place is really really important um, we're very fortunate, we, we employ a full-time chaplain at the school, um, being a Catholic school, and that, that is another area of support that is really valuable uh, for our students. Um, 
because it's another area where they can go and get the support, the spiritual support of the school. So I think that's something that we're very fortunate that we've got two, two paths that the students go, go down. But of course, that's an extra expense that we have to pay for as well as a, a part of that emotional support. Um, the, the other thing I think is important is that with students' mental health impacting their attendance, and also parents' mental health. Um, one of the things I addressed, I think, with the panel, we, we got uh, lots, of sh lots of our students, and, I, I, and we're probably a little bit more privileged than Tom's schools with the, the students that we've got, but we find lots of their parents have got their own issues which aren't being dealt with, oh, yeah. and therefore that's affecting the children. Mm. Um, and that, that's escalated beyond all belief as well. It, 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 and I think that's a huge area that there's only so much you can do with the children because, of course, they're carrying so many extra problems. And then you talk to the social workers and all the support team and they're at capacity as well. And therefore, that has an impact on the young people. Thank you. There's one other thing I'd add that isn't here, and I'd say is more of, if not a development, it's become more and more at the forefront of our minds since our visit, um, and uh, it's the impact of social media. And what we found with problems, it's a boys' school, it, it, uh, boys communicate physically, so it ends up with fights, okay, but fights that are brought into school start on social media outside of school. And we struggle with, um, I, I, I think at times it's actually convincing parents that actually smartphones are a really bad idea until they're much older. Uh, and I get it because there's a sort of social peer pressure almost to have a smartphone as a rite of passage from an increasingly young age. And there's also the pressure from children to, you know, uh, pester power um, to acquire a phone as, at a young age. But one of the things is, is that I think the generation of children we've got, and it will probably become increasingly the case, is so much more tech savvy than certainly I am, um, and certainly their parents are, that parents aren't quite aware, and often we have to disabuse parents of some of the realities that are on their social media, um, but they're shocked by it because they don't necessarily have the control over it because they don't have the understanding of it. So social media as well, not just in terms of, let's say, problems outside of school being brought into school, but also with as well, whether it's um, online bullying or whether it's trolling or whether it's um, uh, really regrettably sending an image or something you wish you had not sent. Um, and we've certainly had issues with that where um, that's out there forever and actually has even become viral in different parts of the world um, intermittently. So social media as well post-pandemic, and I think it's because of the over-reliance of social media during the pandemic, um, becoming a norm, much more of a norm of communication, um, has also made our job significantly more challenging. And almost every behavior issue we look into started on social media, it, it's, the job has become so much bigger because of that. Um, and I don't think we're adequately equipped for that either, but nor do I think of the parents and the students. I don't want to interrupt too much, but the last sentence you used there, I don't think we're adequately equipped. Actually, I think um, given the breadth, and I'm sure the panel would agree with me, given the breadth of challenges that um, leaders and of course students face with all the variety of social pressures, I actually think, um, certainly what I saw, and what we saw in, in schools, was not um, a desperate attempt to keep a lid on it, but it was actually um, uh, organizations that were actually dealing with this, but knew it was happening. My question um, to you, Tom, would be about the um, geography um, aspect. I remember you, yeah. you shared this with us, 
that you know the safety felt better of the, towards the Plumstead area than the Thamesmead area. Is this just a sense? Is this just a sense? Is this just a feeling you have, or is it? Is there evidence? There, for this? there, there is definitely evidence for it. I mean, it's never going to be anecdotal from my perspective. So um, you'll probably be aware that Peabody opened a um, community centre down um, the moorings. Um, which is an area between the back of the school and, and Abbey Wood, that sort of slightly winding 472 route um, there. Um, and I, I never asked about this because I, I wasn't really aware at this point, um, but I suspect in retrospect, in part, it was about sort of reclaiming the space. Um, and I remember going with um, the, my sister school head, um, Lizanne. We went down to visit while it was being built and we've been down a, a number of times since. And um, there is out and out drug dealing um, happening in broad daylight, um, sh shameless sort of um, unmistakable um, drug dealing um, out there amongst adults, but we also know it's happening amongst kids as well. So is that sociable moorings? Is that sociable moorings? Uh, the uh, community yes, center, yes. the community center, that's sociable moorings. Yeah, the moorings in... Um... It's called Sociable Moorings Club. Oh, right, OK. Um, okay. Uh, but you know where I mean. It's a beautiful brick building. And I think, yeah, yes, yeah. Um, so we've seen that on a number of occasions. Um, I've also heard as well from some of our um, staff who are involved in safeguarding, both within a school and within the mat, that actually there are greater issues than that as well um, that happen out there in society. Um, in that immediate society, um, our DSL attends um, a group of schools with the police as well to keep tabs on um, uh, events that are happening in society as well. So we are as prepared as we can be um, for it. But I, I genuinely feel that that area is not, from what I have seen, quite as under the sense of authority, um, sense of scrutiny that you get from a more... I suppose, populated part of London, whether it's like here in the square or again in the openness of the route from the school towards Plumstead Thamesmead um, and doesn't feel as safe. Um, and we know that students do not feel as safe around there as well. Um, I would like to open this up to the panel to um, ask anything of our visiting head teachers. Um, but Bearing in mind what Thomas just said, and we're very fortunate to have Lardy with us, who, who will know this area very well. Um, so if, if there are any panel members who'd like to ask... Um, so <laughs> oh, thank you very much for the update. Um, just like um, Councillor Bird has just said, I actually live in the area. Mm. I live off Bentham Road. And um, I am, um, some of the concerns you've mentioned, I am um, in agreement with it. Um, I know that the community safety team, they're very much aware. Um, neighborhood Moorings as well, um, they, they're a group of residents um, around the Moorings, and they have, um, they have a panel and a board, and they're very much aware as well. I know that um, the police are aware, and they've been working very well, very, very well, with the local businesses there. Mm. Um, what um, I think I would like to ask is that I wish Councillor Morrow, Matt Morrow was here, um, is around the mental health hubs that is planned to be in schools. I totally agree um, that mental health issues among young people are spiraled. Mm. Um, I know that some while back we actually did ask um, for the camps to come and we got a report from them about how they were doing and then link with schools. Um, the interesting angle that you brought in is um, with regards to parents, which I think most times when we as, you know, as a panel, when we talk, we usually major more on the children. But um, the inabilities of parents able to parent their children well is having absolutely massive effect on the children, affecting their developmental milestones, affecting their output in school, affecting their behavior, affecting so many things. What are we doing to working with parents 
Do we have parenting classes? Are we offering those? Um, do we have, you know, what other extracurricular activities will support our schools offering parents that have children that may be struggling or where their children have indicated in the schools that they have issues at home with their parents? 100% agree. Um, I think that the, the, by the time they get to secondary, oh, sorry, by, by the time they get to secondary, it's almost too late though, because when you offer those, the parents who attend and the students attend the extracurricular are the ones you don't really need to try and engage. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, that really is a focus, really, I would have thought at primary, to make sure that those good habits are, are formed at an early age. But if, by the time they almost get to us, it's almost too late. Um, so when you do offer support, it's, it's never those type of parents that, that turn up. When you do the extra enrichment, the, the classes, the, the most resistant people are the ones that actually are the ones that should be there. But do we have those classes? That's what I'm saying. It's not, it's not kind of, yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll try and respond to a number of things. Um, there's a, there we are. Okay, so there is a range of parenting support from the local authority and indeed colleagues in the voluntary sector. Um, some of that's very, very good parenting support. But what we have established is that it's perhaps not widely known and it's not all in one place can it, as a parenting strategy. So Dave, who's here behind us over there, is pulling together and working with our education psychologists, working with our CAMS providers and a whole range of people, Chart and Athletic, to pull together all the parenting work and the parenting support that is available all the way through from naught right the way through to 18. Um, having said that, no matter sometimes what we do in terms of parenting support, life isn't linear, and you might give a lot of parenting support to a child in a primary school, but adolescence comes and something changes and behaviour changes, and sometimes you know, that means that you need some more parenting support. So it's not a linear kind of um, event, and we need to ensure that we've got good parenting support sort of in a, in a range of different ways for different needs and different ages. Um, in terms of the wellbeing hubs, we've been working closely with, with you, as you know, with Councillor Morrow about trying to design some wellbeing hubs for schools that are embedded in schools, but that bridge between what the school can offer and the family home. So working both in school and in families. And our next HEADS partnership, which I hope you both can attend in a couple of weeks, we'll be working with schools to really try and build that model of what... Um, might be the most beneficial for schools. We know what our model is in terms of practice and the work that is impactful for our, our parents and our families outside of school, but we want to be able to ensure that it meets the needs of schools as well. I think we have to look at the whole system. Schools um, commission a lot of different resources. Some of that's effective, some of it might not be so effective. If we kind of pulled it all together and looked at a whole system, which is part of what this review is trying to do as well, um, we might be able to be both more efficient, it costs quite a lot of money to provide sort of counselling and all sorts of services individually. If we looked at it as a collective, we might be able to be more efficient and more effective. So that there is a lot of work happening. I think this commissioning, the variety of commissioning is, is key because schools, I know, can spend lots of money um, inappropriately. So it, it's good to have this. In what, one of our head teachers is just starting a piece of work to look at all the range of commissioning that all the individual schools do for uh, well-being support and mental health and sort of crime reduction type work and pulling that all together in a, in a kind of a cohesive way to, for us all to understand that range. We've done some of it. Uh, Dave did some work about commissioning that was very specific to mental health. but We know there's a range of other uh, work that schools are commissioning individually, which might be fine, but it might not be the most effective.
Thank you for coming to speak to us. Uh, the question is for Stuart. Um, as you may know I represent Eltham Town and Avery Hill. And I was just, when you were speaking, um, just listening to things that perhaps I could pick up or at least try. And I know you mentioned about the police liaison officer. Can I just ask, does that come... Um, is that from the like the local safer neighbourhoods team? That that no, it's a separate team. Oh, okay, I was just thinking because um, if such, I could then pick up. I'll say something about it. it's a separate team. The police are organised in, in sort of different ways, and the the police teams uh, in schools are often pulled out to do all sorts of different ones. One of the challenges is, is that all the evidence base doesn't support strongly that police officers in schools is the most effective way. So the police themselves aren't completely committed to safer schools officers. Schools like them, schools feel that they help, but actually evidence on reducing crime and policing, there is very, very little evidence that it's the most effective use of their time. So. They, they pull out those police officers in many schools. The resources shrunk enormously. It's a very, very limited resource across the whole of London now. And there are some safer schools officers, but uh, not many. Um, whether we, we think they're effective and we've got some evidence of that, we could build a, a stronger case for the evidence. Um, I, I'm not sure we'd have to all discuss that together and see whether there's an evidence base, but that's one that's the crux of it actually. Thank you, that's helpful. Uh, I, I think where it does come in really handy is once the students know the police officers and they've got used to knowing them, when they're out and about after school on Eltham High Street, where your school mm -hmm. is, then you've got that familiar face and, and that I think is what the students would want, knowing that going to and from school, there, there is that safety. And there is, a, it, it's a friendly face of the police as well, because the police don't always have a reputation of going to be um, constructive in their relationships with teenagers. So it does humanize, um, obviously an important pillar of our society in that sense. So it does have um, some un unintended positive consequences as well, um, than just crime reduction, just safety for students on site and off site yeah. um, and is that something Stuart that the kind of at the moment you have quite good links with the safer neighborhood the local kind of safer neighborhood team or is that something no no I wouldn't say so okay uh, cool it, it might just be you know through Cause just, lack of dialogue but yeah it's something that I'd be interested to get there's a new sergeant that has just come in in Elton Town and Avery Hill so perhaps um, I've got your email anyway, because I think we've emailed previously, so we can link him. Cool, thanks. Something hot of the press. Um, so only this week I met with a new assistant superintendent who has the responsibility for safer schools, and he's asked for me to organise a meeting of secondary heads in particular to talk about their current strategy and, and, and get input from there. So that there will be some dialogue soon. Great. And Sammy, I've just remembered and I said to you no they're not part of safer neighborhoods and they are so the police are organized in three structures youth crime comes under detectives safeguarding comes under partnerships and I in my head had safer schools under partnerships and just thinking about it it's not safer schools comes under neighborhoods so it does come under neighborhoods I've just worked it through in my head <laughs> yeah that, that's absolutely amazing news. That, yeah, uh, well done. The, the other thing I think that you see all is, is the impact of you know, illegal drugs on the students at the school, and it's, it's, oh. that's, that's escalated beyond all belief as well mm. in the last few years. I'm sure you all, we had five young ladies um, had, oh, hospitalised not that long ago because of bringing illegal drugs into the school, and yeah, the, you know, we are, I, I've never seen that before, and it, it really is starting to grow and from what the police are saying, it's, you know, and I'm sure you see it all, all through Greenwich it's, and the country, to be honest. It's hidden now, um, so cannabis has distinct smell, but THC does not. Um, and actually, we're, um, uh, we're having a, um, the police help us with a search um, next week um, on site, and actually we've, uh, we've had a professor from, I forget the university, who's actually trying to develop a machine to test liquids for THC um, and spice, um, which are the two things that are often 
more readily available, even in shops, we've heard, um, being sold illegally, um, and added to vapes, you, you can't tell. There's no smell, there's no obvious thing. So we're looking into that to see if we can be part of that trial, but safely and without criminalizing anyone or anything like that, um, to see if um, it has any benefits, because obviously if we can test for these sort of things, as it's not so obvious, but it is incredibly prevalent. Um, vaping is incredibly prevalent, but the contents of that, we cannot be certain of. It's sometimes only when we've seen the effects on the students, but we know pretty clearly through our school nurse um, that um, uh, it's more than just an innocent-ish liquid. Mm. Yes, thank you, Chair. One of the things we picked up during our visits was the inequality of provision for special needs. There were some schools had seemed to have a very high percentage and others um, really quite small. And it was, some of them certainly was due to the fact that they had both expertise and also facilities to look after children with special needs. And the question really to put to the heads is, do you think we should be doing more perhaps to uh, spread the load generally about the schools rather than to put it just in one or two places? That's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, because uh, if you look at the percentages across the, the schools in the borough, then there is a big uh, difference between the schools. Um, obviously, at, where, where we can, we try and support the students as best we can, and especially ones with the educational health care plan. Um, at the moment, a lot of the... We, we try and support the parents' request. Um, and that means that certain schools are more popular than others, and especially the more successful schools. Um, whether that is in the best interest in the long term of the child or not, um, I'm always hesitant. So, for example, we've got a young man in Year 7 who's commuting all the way from one side of the borough to us because we were the priority for the parent, and he's late every single day to school. Um, he's got his special needs. He's got three buses to get. And I, I, I sometimes wonder whether that side is taken into account of what is the best for that young person. Okay, educationally, we might be very good for him, but at the moment, he's getting all sorts of trouble because he is falling behind his education because he's late so often. Um, and that affects him and his um, enjoyment of school. Um, I don't know, because we're not particularly, uh, you know, you've been to the school, it's an old building, we're not particularly, um, uh, designed to support children with needs and we're, we're very popular and that's probably to do with the support that we can give and we've got an excellent team. Um, I don't feel I've got enough experience around the borough to, to comment but it does create problems when you have a certain number of students who come with severe needs and whether you can support them with the right guidance and support that you actually require for them. It, it's, it's a difficult one. Yeah, I, I mean, I would pretty much agree with everything that Stuart said there um, in terms of I don't know. <laughs> um, um, from my own perspective, one of the absurdities, and this is a national problem, and, and pretty much everything we're talking about here is a national problem, incidentally. And, and before I go any further, there's a huge amount of positivity <laughs> within the schools in terms of what we do yeah. as well. But, but this is focusing on the bleaker sides, if you like, the problems. Putting that to one side, um, uh, one of the absurdities, I think, about school funding, and as I said, this is a national issue, is that you get um, an uplift for deprivation, and somehow that's correlated with actually the educational need of the students, which is not the same. So, of course, we get additional money from local authority, but at a national level, it doesn't necessarily equate. It sometimes does. So it's a correlation, potentially, but not necessarily a distinct one. So the, the fundamental issue, and I think every school would say this, is there's never enough money, obviously, to provide everything we would like to do. And even if, through the munificence of some organisation, we got a million pounds more, that probably wouldn't be enough either. The needs are that great. One of the issues that we face with regard to SEN in particular um, is the undiagnosed needs until they come to us. Um, and uh, I can see how that happens, because I think in a smaller, more costed um, 
environment that primary school will offer needs may not arise or not become apparent. But then when you move from that much smaller environment with fewer adults, fewer students, familiarity, to a big, ugly, old secondary school that's scary, um, I think needs then become more apparent actually uh, quite soon to us. And then ascertaining those needs, because that takes time, money, professional, uh, professionals to do that, um, uh, is probably one of the biggest issues that we deal with. I do not have uh, a complaint or an issue uh, with the number of uh, same kids we've got. Um, our EHC plans are relatively modest compared to most in the local authority. Um, we probably should have more, but that's probably more from a diagnosis of our current uh, students on the record of need as opposed to um, new entrants coming in for e uh, with EHCPs. 100%. Uh, the, the, the undiagnosed children yes. are by yeah. far, because they don't come with the money, they don't come with the, the plan, yeah. and they're often the ones that need the most support yeah. and help, because actually the ones with the educational health care plans, well, actually, they've got all the support around them, and yeah. they've got the money, and we've got the, we, they're, we've got the diagnosis. Yes. So you actually can really cater for them really well. Yeah. And often the ones who haven't got the, they often kind of have parents who aren't pushing for the educational health care plan, and that goes back to the parenting, and it could be the parents either culturally don't want their child to be stigmatised with a, a diagnosis or that they've got their own mental health issues and they don't want that then passed on to the child or they don't have the, the capacity to, to fill in the forms and the rest of it, and it's kind of been missed. And they're the, always the hardest ones to cater for. Yeah, we can take two more questions, I think, because our head teachers have had a hard day. Jo Joshua, would you like to... Thank you, um, and thanks for coming in. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, no, I, I think the, the only question I have perhaps is related back to, and by the way, I really recognize your work in an extremely stretched and demanding um, an environment. And I'm just wondering what efforts have been made in relation to reaching back out to alumni or to people that you perhaps feel may not be, you know, professionally trained as teachers or something like that, but perhaps you feel from your experience working with them during the school years, maybe people that could perhaps be champions or voices of change or inspiration for students. I think, and I'm sure we will agree, that some students don't respond or just don't listen to the adults in the room. They perhaps connect more to more familiar faces. Is that something that has been evidence-based, has shown a pattern of success, or you feel there's no chance that will work? Um, it's, we're a funny old school. Um, once you're a poly boy, you're always a poly boy, and actually we have a number of teachers who were poly boys. <laughs> um, so um, once you're in our institution, we don't let go. Um, we have a lot of returning boys. Um, we have, for instance, we, we run a number of Saturday and holiday schools and that sort of thing, and two of our ex-students uh, who are ridiculously bright mathematicians are coming in to teach um, our year 13s. Um, yeah, I think we've got about six or more teachers who used to be students, and we've even got some who've started it, um, like with LSAs, and then through um, a uh, number of years have then progressed into being teachers as well. So it's, it's something that I think is a real strength of a school. Um, one of the things that we were talking about, which goes back to recruitment uh, sort of issue, is that if you like the national narratives out there around teaching um, are pretty forbidding right now. Um, and Stuart shared with me an interpretation earlier, I don't know if to steal your thunder or let you have it about the NEU stuff. But yeah. yeah. Um, so you've got often a right-wing press which uh, will berate teachers, um, nurses or angels, and we're scum, um, to put it, you know, uh, simplify it. Um, you've got all the narrative about how hard the job is, and then you've got the strike action and everything else as well. Um, and it is a tough job, but incredibly rewarding, but that bit sometimes gets lost, um, which I wonder, along with the discussions about whether teachers get paid enough or whatever else, if therefore there are more attractive jobs. So and most of our students will leave us and quite rightly not become teachers and hopefully go on with much better paid jobs with 
great ambitions in a city or wherever they want to go. Um, but some do return. Um, but I think it retaining the alumni, if you like, is probably more of a challenge, if that makes sense. And, and uh, we, 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 we employ about 10 ex-students at our school um, out of 60, so it's a big proportion. Mm -hmm. um, the ones you, who have volunteered to come back, though, tend to be the more confident graduates who are sometimes the least Sort of people, you, they're great to qualify as a teacher, but sometimes you want the ones who can engage with the yes. the other end of the school. Yeah. And it's hard to find that type of child who has the confidence to then go back to maybe they weren't the best student, but are the ones that could work really, really <laughs> yeah. well with the, the more challenging students that you've got. Um, and they're the ones that you tend to lose quite quickly. And not having a sick form at our school means that you lose them that little bit more because, of course, they go to a different school where they then use them once yeah. they go. So it, we, we struggle from not having that sick form as well to keep that contact. Um, thank you very much, and thank you very much for sharing with us your, your, your concerns. Um, and I'd just like to go back to this talking about how we engage with parents, because um, I know that... Um, for example, when County Lines first came into the news, um, talking to um, a colleague who was a clerk in, in Bexley, saying that a lot of parents had absolutely no idea what was facing their children and how to counteract it. And listening to some of the concerns that you have, I'm just wondering how we get the message out to parents um, without scaring them witless because you don't want them scared witless you but you want them engaged in how they can best support their children through a very very difficult period at the moment um we um it, it's interesting because as you were speaking um i was thinking to myself how can we improve our practice because we find that we have on the whole pretty strong relationships with our parents and they'll attend almost anything um, it's certainly in terms of the academic progress, parents' evenings, celebration evenings, etc. Um, as you were speaking, though, I was thinking, because we've run a couple of evenings um, around, um, obviously, the risks of knife crime, um, THC, um, and, um, and uh, social media, uh, those three pressing issues. And actually, they weren't very well attended at all. I think the, the largest number we had was something like two parents. So it makes me wonder, as you were speaking, whether we need to combine it almost like, yeah, you thought you were coming in for academic review day or whatever, but we're also going to do a bit of this at the same time, and it's really valid. Um, and that's thinking about it probably the way that we need to go, because they're already a captive audience. Also, I, you know, let's be honest about it, our parents are working long hours themselves, um, and school hours and work hours don't necessarily always align. Um, so it's probably trying to kill two birds with one stone so that it's not so onerous on them to come in repeatedly um, and we do it that way. We do, however, follow it up with messages on our gateway, with resources. We have um, a messaging system, My Child at School, that we can send information out on as well. Um, but I, uh, there is still, I think... Uh, a sort of it, it almost like it, it can't happen around here, but actually it does. Um, and what you're saying about county lines, I think, applies exactly in the same way to vaping with THC or spice, to knife crime, and also to social media. And social media probably being the crux of both of those um, as well. Mm. I can hear a lot of nods and a lot of agreement there, uh, Tom uh, and Stuart. I mean, um, I think it's incumbent on the whole of society to keep people informed, if I'm honest. And I would like to say that um, about the teaching profession, that, that, that there's an awful lot laid at teachers' door and leaders' doors. And I do feel that, you know, we can, um, as a society, we can, we, can, we can take more on in those broader senses. Um, I can hear, Lardy, you would like to ask one more question, and this will be the last one, right? OK. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'm talking from a di slightly different perspective now. So we've looked at the children, we've talked about the parents. 
I know that this scrutiny is about emotional well-being support for children and young people. However, what about the teachers? Um, you said something earlier, Stuart, that you, uh, parents can't give what they don't have. The same thing with teachers. Um, we're funny that classrooms these days are no longer the typical kind of classrooms we used to have in those days. Um, a lot more kids are very challenging. Um, and I think Tom kind of mentioned earlier about um, challenges with retaining good staff. How are we supporting our teachers? Um, it was only one of the schools that was visited that mentioned having mental health first aiders there. Is this something that we're thinking of um, empowering um, teachers to be emotionally sound enough to be able to support their students? Because what we're finding out now is that um, we're from the sector where I work at the moment, a lot of people are going off sick because of mental health issues, because of challenges at work. We're having to do more with less. So how are we supporting our teachers? I think that's really important. 100% agree. Um, it's, uh, that's another area that's hugely um, grown since I've been in the profession. Um, yeah, they, they have access to our school counsellor. We have mental health. Uh, yeah, we, they have access to our school counsellor. It's, it's not just for the students. The staff use our school counsellor as well. Um, but we also have mental health first aiders. The impact of that, I, I don't know, because um, I, I don't know how, how much research that has been into the impact of mental health first aiders. I, I personally haven't seen the impact myself, but that might just be my school. Um, the, the big issue goes back to what Tom was saying, is about retention and recruitment. Uh, at this stage, you know, we're, we're in a city school, so we get the advantage that you got the, the, the extra money to attract some staff, but for example, I've advertised for an art teacher for the last six months. I've not had one applicant, not one. Um, and therefore, we've, we're, we're having to rely on a body to come into a classroom. It's not going to be the best person. We know they're going to come in with issues, but it's desperate times, and you need someone in there. And you think, oh, I, in a normal world, I would never employ this person to be in front of children. And that has an impact on them, it has an impact on their other staff because they're picking up the problems that this staff is in. But we're at that point in education where there is no one out there who wants to be a teacher. So that does have a huge impact. And that one, one person you've employed has a huge impact on other staff because they're picking up so much extra work. And then they go off with stress or anxiety. And, um, I, it, it, and like Tom said, we're in this problem now where it's just self-perpetuating because the worse it gets, the more that's advertised, why would you want to come into this profession? I, can I... Um, so, sorry, Vicky, sorry, I don't get me started. Um, I don't think we have the answer to your question, in all honesty, and um, I was looking at our staff absence data um, uh, relatively recently for over a period of time, I think it was November to February or something, and comparing it to the same last year. And last year was really high in terms of absenteeism. This year was 50% 50, 50 more, um, which is a genuine worry, and I had it broken down. Um, we've been unfortunate with a lot of hospitalizations beyond our control, but putting those to one side, mental health has been uh, uh, certain, certainly a significant uptick in absenteeism due to that. Um, so I googled it to do some research on this about any correlations between um, uh, poverty, because that is a sort of an underlying theme in our area, um, and teacher absenteeism. And actually I couldn't find any national research whatsoever. There was a UN report, which was more of an international, uh, looking at countries in terms of relative poverty, which certainly saw a correlation. I might draw from that a certain correlation that might be applicable on a more local or regional level. I don't know, but there is no research on it. With regard to well-being as well, I want to reinforce something that Stuart said, because we are, I think, genuinely really conscientious um, about our staff's well-being, and we do a number of different things um, to enable that. Um, in the day-to-day -day practice, we've... Um, We've cut out unnecessary things. We've done 
um, things to motivate. Um, we have a well-being weekend and, and various things, but in a sense I can see they are sort of sticking plasters. It doesn't fundamentally alter um, the students. And I'm not having a go at the students here, incidentally, I feel for them. Um, it doesn't fundamentally alter the students or the challenging dynamics that, we, that they are facing and we are facing. But what can happen, as I think Stuart's alluding to, is we can do more and more, and we found as a senior leadership team we've done more and more, but then what about us? It doesn't go anywhere else. And it, it is, it, it, it's fundamentally, I think it's, it is one of recruitment and um, having a more resilient staff, and that's not sweeping under the carpet the problems that exist. Um, but I think it is having a more resilient staff, let alone potentially more staff, you know, to be realistic. Um, but I don't know the answer to it, to be honest with you. I think we're still living through the experience. Vicky, please. I yeah. don't know the answer to it either, but I do believe strongly that one thing that all of us have, as head teachers or ex-head teachers can do is within our schools, and, and we talked about this at the head teachers conference recently, didn't we? is make sure that we have schools and, and, and cultures where there's manageable workload, because if the workload is not too high, then teachers and support staff and people who work in schools then have the time to do things to enable their own well-being and to support their own mental health. And, and I think lots of the, the problems come from the pressures that have historically come from the top and higher, uh, you know, expectations on schools and how that's come down. So. I think that's that's something that practically, you know, had, is in the gift of head teachers. I, I think that's a good point, Vicky, and I, I'm glad you brought that up. Florence would like to. <laughs> However, we, we're going to end up in a debate, aren't we? However, the school budgets are so constrained now because uh, schools aren't funded sufficiently from the government. So. If you've got a constrained budget, you can't inf impose and ensure manageable workloads because you've got to reduce your numbers of staff and therefore everybody's workload gets higher. So we're, it's not just a conundrum about children and their mental health, it's a conundrum about the whole system. The school, the funding, the teachers, the recruitment, you know, teachers, young people can earn more working in shops now than they can in, in schools. I think, um, I think that's absolutely right, and I think this is a huge debate, which I think we would all enjoy sharing, um, because, um, you know, we have before us here two people who are, you know, great examples of what's going on in our schools and have brought to our plate, in front of us, all the issues that they, they're dealing with. Um, and if you gave anybody that job, they'd just say, no, thank you. Um, but you go back and you do it and you make a really, really good, you, you are providing for the children of Greenwich uh, an amazing, amazing opportunity. We wanted you to come here because we wanted to hear from you what your day looks like. And I think we've all got a good picture now. Um, and I want to, if you don't mind, just say thank you very much, both of you, Tom and Stuart, uh, but also, the team behind you. Um, if you could take back to your schools, please, um, and to your to your colleagues, um, our gratitude for their for their work that they continue to do with our children. We have got. We're going to take back the issues that you you have laid before us. We've got other colleagues that we can liaise with, and and Sam is on on with something we this is this is what we're about so scrutiny isn't just about picking holes in what's going on it's actually moving things forward um, and this panel is very good at that so i would ask panel members please if they want to contact our head teachers if you can do that by email on a person if you don't mind on a personal level um, but i would like to applaud you and your colleagues for all the work you're doing on behalf of the panel um, and to say, I'm going to see you again, hopefully very soon. We all are. Um, and take care of yourselves. And I think Thank you for that. It's an open invitation to any of the members mm. to come. To, uh, certainly, I'm yeah. sure you're saying to your school. It, yeah, it's nice to actually have people to come in 
and taken an interest. Mm. Um, the kids love that. That's and the kids love like. it as well. So any opportunity, if you're walking past the school, pop in. Mm. Uh, it's, it's that easy. And there's always a couple of students who love leaving lessons to be a tour guide <laughs> and show you around the school. So um, it's always welcome. And teachers people. increasingly. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Through the agenda. Um, so we're on to item six, which is our quarterly performance monitoring, which actually seems, you know, hard. Thank you, Joe. So, uh, right, yes. Um, if we would like, can we deal with this the way we, we normally deal with it? I mean, we don't want to go through this page by page. Um, and I obviously, I think the panel will have picked up what they want to, want to ask. But if you'd like to share with us, Joe, your um, couple of major concerns and, and, and your successes, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So um, I think everyone's familiar with the format we have and probably know it and love it um, by now. So I always assume panel members have, have, have read it and will have questions. Um, in terms of reflections, I think the main thing, the, the, the bulk or where there's the heavy lifting in the report is obviously quite rightly around our sort of um, most vulnerable and, and, and most risk cohorts around our social care um, world and I think it's obviously a mix of, of measures in there and you'll, you'll see sort of the, the rag ratings but I think the real message um, I want to get across is it's, it's a very steady state in a very stable area so whilst we've seen a few measures sort of perhaps start to creep in different directions and I'm happy to take on questions if anyone's got any about those the overall picture is still one of, um, of, of strength and good performance um, we have to benchmark ourselves against something, and London and England are our benchmarks. Um, we're never complacent when, even if we see we're still comparing well to benchmarks, we take our eye off what our own direction of travel is. Um, sometimes I think, I think benchmarking can be very useful, but it can also be um, a bit divisive because you get complacent, and that's something we certainly don't, don't do. Um, so I think it's one in that area of absolute still rigour and... Um, if ever I go to the service leads, of which many you've, you've met in these, and ask them a question, I need to understand a little bit more what's going on. They were always, they've got the answers, they've got the understanding. Um, so that's, I think, sort of the positive. Some of the figures might not look as positive they ever have, but it's an overall positive picture. Um, and I anticipate you obviously had, had said, um, Chair, at the start, you are naturally drawn into the Reds. And, you know, it is obvious we do have one area where we've talked very positively over um, probably the last six to nine months about um, improvement with regards to our um, SEND timescales. And unfortunately, quarter three did see uh, a, a dip in the other direction. Some of that is linked, it's not making excuses, it is linked to the time of the year. We do see fewer plans coming through, but naturally with the um, sort of, in that quarter you've got sort of half term, you've also got the lead up into Christmas. I think we spoke before about, I think there was a question about what constitutes plans that are subject to exceptions and, and, and not. Um, and over that time, there is a lot of absence of staff, key staff not available, schools not always being there for the, obviously the full period. Um, it does affect the figures, notwithstanding that is no excuses. We're very aware of performance dipped in that area um, and the service are very aware of that. So it would have been, you know, wrong of me not to have acknowledged from the start that we do have a red this quarter so but i'm happy to open it up to questions whatever those may be thank you very much joe and actually that you know obviously um anticipates what i was going to say because that's the only question i had that we were still red and over 20 weeks waiting for our education health care plan um um implementations what I do know is that, and, and I'm seeking reassurance here, is that um, what we have done in the past is when, when um, students, pupils are identified for education healthcare plans, that we provide the support 
uh, even though the plan is not complete. Um, that you know the support is put in place, and I, I, I guess we're seeking reassurance that that is still the case. Also, we would like to know how we can move this forward. You know what it is that we need to um, to help because it, it is a sticking point. It is a sticking point, and behind all that, there are children, and and I know you feel it as much as we do. So, um, just just to say, you know. Um, if you can come up with anything with that. Sure, and I'll absolutely defer <laughs> to my, my experts in the, in, in, in the room on, on, on that one. If that's all right, Nikki. Um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right, Councillor Burge. You'll notice that there were quite a significantly higher number that came in in that quarter than in the year before. And what we know anecdotally, but you don't, is there was also a reduction in staff. So we had a number of, of, of people who handed in their notice before Christmas. So in terms of reassurance, what I can tell you is we've had a recruitment drive and had a really high number of applicants for um, assessment and review officers. Um, and we're at the moment planning a really thorough induction program for them to, because just like I had teacher colleagues, um, recruitment and retention is, is a real challenge in this area. So we're, uh, yeah, we're, we're working on our package, but I'm, I've, I think those are two of the reasons why you're seeing that red, and you won't next time. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's great. Okay, Councillor Ben. Uh, thank you very much, and apologies for being late um, arriving today. So you've kind of already answered my first question um, that I had there, but uh, also on um, EHCPs, um, <clears throat> I guess other question would just be, because um, it wasn't in there, but what's the current sort of um, appeal um, rate and then the success rate of appeal? So how many people are appealing the plans and then therefore also what impact that has on clearing through that uh, backlog, which you know, has seen incredible progress over the last year, and I think the team should be really proud of of that. Um, and then I guess also uh, sort of slightly connected to that as well is how effective are we in looking at some of the EHCP reviews? Because you know, there's meant to be the seven-year um, review for all EHCPs, and every year you look at does it need to be reviewed, and if there's been a significant change of circumstances, then Yes, what, how are we kind of with managing through some of, some of that? I'm going to try to un answer your questions. So the second part of it in terms of uh, reviewing the EHCPs and particularly the annual reviews I think you're talking about, that was, um, that was our, our one main recommendation that came from our inspection last year. Um, we've got a, a, a really thorough action plan in place, so I'm making good progress on that. Um, the first part of your question in terms of appeals, there are a lot. So when, um, so at the first stage of, of when um, an application is made for an EHCP, um, it goes to a panel to decide whether an assessment should be made. And the criteria set down in the code of practice is so broad, so broad that um, that, that are pretty much anyone who, where them, I think the wording is there might be a, a, a special need, which is, can, be, can be very broad, will get through those appeals. And then that, that inevitably means that our educational psychologist service, their resources are poured in at this stage and then find quite a lot of those children shouldn't necessarily progress to the next step. But there are, there are appeals at each stage, yeah. And it's for another time and another question in terms of tribunals related to places <laughs> that we have in the borough. But yeah, we won't go into that now. So there's currently a SEND strategy being written that's due to be published in the early autumn. Um, we've also started a SEND improvement board and uh, bringing together the partners to build on the inspection, but also to implement the strategy and to build on the strategy. And we haven't had an item at scrutiny that's focused on EHC, on SEND for some while. And I wondered if you would like to have a, a detailed uh, presentation and discussion about SEND, because I'm just very mindful that you haven't, we haven't had that for a while. You have it every 
time we meet in the performance, but that's the headlines. It's not the detail as you're asking about appeals. And on the top of my head, I can't answer that. And so I think it might be helpful. I, my colleagues will probably <laughs> not like me for saying that, but I, I think it might be useful for us. I, I think we'll take that forward as a, an agenda item for, for future scrutiny. I mean, if it goes on the agenda, then something else can't go on there. So, we, you know, we'll tailor the agenda accordingly. I think that would be helpful to members. Thank you for suggesting that, Florence. That's great. Do we have any more questions? Yes. I'd just like to say thank you very much for putting this report together, very detailed, and I can just imagine the work that went on behind. Thank you so much. And for me, this is a positive, this is a plus, um, because um, I know that last year we sat here, I was one of the ones that raised questions around giving us, um, requesting for details around care leavers known to be in suitable accommodation. And from what I, I'm seeing here, I'm really, really happy to see a move up in the percentages. So this is really good. So thank you to the team that are working really hard we all know at the moment that housing is a massive issue. Procuring accommodation for whether vulnerable people, families and all of that, it's almost like a fight between various local authorities. It's a fact that the first one, two, three quarters uh, for 2023-24, um, there's been a significant improvement from the previous year and uh, from previous financial year. So can you just give our thanks to the team working really hard behind the scene. Thank you, Kelsey. I've, I've feed that, but I'm regularly, almost daily in contact with, um, it's in Ashara's world, but um, particularly Carol, who I think has, has been here before, she sort of looks after the care leave service and the PAs. And coming back to what you were talking about, I think the schools around those sort of positive relationships between what is technically seen as an officer or authority figure and a young person. We are talking, you know, young people here, not, not children. I think the PAs sort of do epitomise, as do some of our um, youth offending workers sometimes, where they're dealing with some of the children that are a bit, oh, again, young people that have been through some of the most acute trauma and challenge, and they're trying to engage them in positive activities and education and, you know, get them in a place where they can sort of sustain suitable accommodation. And it has been a real big push. And actually, just anecdotally, and, and I know we don't sort of, like I said, we don't, shouldn't benchmark ourselves, but we've done a bit of a push um, through our sort of performance network around the DfE about how they sort of actually sort of calculate and, and sort of hold us to account on some of these figures. And they've sort of actually sort of been making it quite difficult for us around sort of who, who counts and who doesn't. So what I can't formally sort of show because I'm not allowed to, but actually sometimes the figures look slightly better than what we can present to you because there are certain young people where we've discharged our duties through age assessments and things like that where they have been deemed, they have been returned to the Home Office as adults, um, but the DfE insists we still count them. Um, so it's something that one of my colleagues had an absolute bee in her bonnet and rightly have challenged the DfE and we've got a bit of a body of evidence across London, particularly now going, yeah, hang on, you're right. So, um, you know, it's always that sort of thing behind every single figure. There is a young person, there is an individual story. But I, I will take it back. I'm about to speak to Carol soon. I'll take it back and, and, and thank them on your behalf. Thank you. Um, and also to echo Councillor Ade, um, I do love a performance monitor report. Um, no, that, yeah, they're very helpful actually. Um, I wanted to um, <clears throat> quickly check something that, for my understanding, I wanted to clarify regarding um, people missing from home or missing from care. It's, yeah. <clears throat> page 58, I think it is. Um, yeah, this, this perhaps seems, in my mind, slightly concerning if it's going up. And if it is, <clears throat> I don't think it's, a, it's you know, entirely your sort of remit to deal with, but what, what do we think is the cause of that? Sure. So, yeah, I think we aren't acknowledged in the quarter two report where probably it was one of the areas I picked up and put a little narrative that... Um, we are aware the figures are creeping up. That amber in the context it is an area that the service are monitoring and they always monitor closely. But again, that was um, the figures aren't at a point where perhaps we've got significant 
concerns because we have seen the figures much higher in the past and what we do find in this area in particular, some of it is driven by risk and concern behaviour and some of it is driven by sometimes um, actually parents being in a position where they are more likely to alert us to potential risk and harm. So it, it, it can sometimes be both those things going on. Um, but as I say this with every area, but missing in particular, and I think we flagged in last quarter's report, we have a dedicated missing coordinator now whose sort of core purpose within the safeguarding service is to work with practitioners to ensure, A, in its most practical sense, the reporting and recording is correct, so we're conscious that we're giving you correct figures but also support some of those practitioners around um, how they're having some of those conversations with those young people around trying to understand what some of the drivers, the push-pull um, factors that are behind some of their missing behavior. Because what we, what we find is, and particularly for home, um, it tends to be not, it's not an insignificant number of children go missing, but most children that go missing from home will do it just the once for a short period of time. Um, it will be reported rightly by parents, um, but it is, it is the one and only time that happens. What we tend to find with our care cohort in particular is we have a small cohort of, of young people that go missing f frequently, and not to sound dismissive, a number of those young people, the service will not be overly concerned about because we know where they go. We know, sort of, we know their stories quite well, but there is a duty on... Um, placements to report young people when they're not back, when they're expected to be back. So, so, so some of that is what's going on um, with, within those figures. But yeah, it, it is an area that the service are on top of um, and we continue to monitor um, closely. And what I can perhaps do when we do the quarter four report is do one of my sort of more expanded paragraphs just to pick up again on where we are trying not to repeat the same things to you each time, but I'll make a note that for quarter four, we'll just dip into that a bit more again and give you a bit of a paragraph that just gives, just brings a bit of the context to who they are, what their sort of characteristics are, if that would be helpful. No, no, thank you very much, Chair. So just one last one as well on kind of the one other amber area, which is uh, a bit of slight concern in terms of the number of kids becoming subject to a child protection plan for the second time. Um, I mean, the numbers are still overall quite small, but uh, is this the result of a sort of a particular incident, this spike? And obviously, I know you can't go into too much detail on some of this to ensure you know, confidentiality of, um, of anybody involved. Um, or is this because of the, the timings of when we sort of go back and revisit to make sure um, that kids uh, that young people are doing well having come out of a, a uh, child protection plan? So I, I added a bit of context on this one because it's a question with my performance hat, I'm probably driving my colleagues um, nuts on it. But yeah, it's, it stood out as us that it has, it has crept up um, across the year, both in terms of the repeat within two years and the repeat ever because we track, we track both. So a repeat plan is a repeat regardless of the time scale um, and the service routinely look at every single start and cease across all our frameworks so child in need child protection care um, monthly um, so they do deep dives each month into either a theme but they consistently and that's under Teresa's um, sort of guy she, she coordinates that um, they will look at every start to establish if this is a repeat what do we think is the the, the issues behind that repeat. Um, is it a um, young person that, or a family that's perhaps been stepped down previously and for whatever reason the step down has perhaps not, not been as, as successful as we've hoped and for the right reasons we've taken the decision to step them back up to a, a higher threshold? Are they families that have maybe ceased because they've left the borough and then they've come back to us so they are technically a repeat for us albeit the reason why it ceased was because they moved out of the borough. Um, Joe, there is also a call on just saying that there's a couple of families at the moment with a lot of children, with seven children. Yeah. Every child is counted individually, so it's not the family that's counted, it's every single child. And when you have very large families, that will increase our numbers significantly. 
Yeah. Yeah, and we've had a couple of those come back, and it does it does flag. But I can certainly give the reassurance that if colleagues were here, and obviously within the realms of what you can say in the public arena, they know every single one of those families, individual, the reasons behind them. And what I think the report tried to flag is for some of those um, families, we've kind of got two distinct cohorts. We've got those that are on the pathway that actually we feel um, with continued work, um, there will be a safe progression in the positive direction of step down. And some of them are going down a different route and they are going through proceedings. So I think we're very confident, um, whilst the figures still look okay, it's flagged amber because we don't like to see any of those figures go up. But ultimately, we always come down that the, the decision making has to be right, whatever impact it might have on our figures. Um, and the decision making on each of those cases has been looked at um, very, very closely. Yeah, Pauline. Yeah. Thank you for the report. Um, can I ask questions about the NEAP figures for 16 and 17 year olds, which I noticed you said were rising and that uh, was becoming a bit worrying? Um, do we have any information on the sort of protected characteristics of the children that are neat at that age? Um, and do we have any evidence that, you know, it's because their needs aren't being met by the post-16 offers that are available to them? And are, you know, is there a process by which schools are identifying in their year 11 cohorts which children might be um, at risk of becoming neat? Yep, so I think we, we've, we've been tracking, and what I was trying to sort of set out in the, in the report, just for context, there's, there's, there's different measures of it. So the, the measure I think um, we're certainly keeping an eye on is that universal measure of needs. So that's all the 16 and 17 year olds in Greenwich, um, whether or not they're engaging effectively in post 16 or um, employment or training. And it has started to creep up. Um, what sits behind it, um, there is a level of breakdown we can do into characteristics. Um, it's, it's sort of done at a regional level. So there's a sort of southeast region, then the London level around the tracking, because we're talking sort of thousands of children. Um, so the, the, the levels at which it is tracked at is the universal. Um, they will look at the overlap, sort of the intersection with SEND. Um, I'm trying to think what's included. They also include, they used to traditionally include or historically teenage parents, which was very, very small. Um, and then you start to sort of move into a bit of an overlap with um, care leavers, if you've had care leavers that have left in that sort of 16 to 17 age range. So I can certainly link back with the lead service just to see whether we can granulate that anymore. And I, again, bearing in mind, sort of bringing the quarter four, if the figure's still not gone. Because what we sometimes find in this is a real concerted effort um, within the service to get a bit more traction from the young people around disclosing where they are. The figures can look better quite quickly. Um, but we're, we're pulling the quarter four stuff together now. So if the quarter four is still looking, you know, not where we would want it to be, but regardless, I can sort of see what we could un unpick underneath that. I think there is a genuine um, correlation across all the areas, whether we look at um, our young offenders, our care leavers, um, around for some young people, the offer that's there just isn't an offer for them. So lots of children will get to the end of their GCSE year and post-16 is not what they aspire to be. I think quarter, the reason why quarter two is never reported is because of that churn. Where we have anecdotally seen figures rise is often around quarter three, because quarter three sort of kicks in in that autumn term. And for a lot of sort of, you know, newly 16 year olds who've just come out of the, you know, let's be fair, the trauma of doing their GCSEs, the last thing they want to think about is um, carrying on in education. But some of those young people will re engage two or three months down the line when they've made a decision, do I want to go to sixth form? Do I want to look at an apprenticeship? Do I want to look at a sixth form college which maybe has a different curriculum that's more afforded to it? So we will absolutely look at quarter four, but sometimes that is what's, what's going on. There's still ultimately young people trying to make up their minds what they want to do with the next sort of two years of their lives. I think for the ones where an academic route is not their preference, 
I do think there is a particular challenge for those young people around traditionally what might have been there as a wider opportunity to get into work. It, it is harder for young people to find those opportunities. Well, sorry to cut in, Joe. Yeah. I mean, I'm really hoping our apprentice scheme can offer, oh, absolutely. offer stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, yeah. and, of course, vocational courses, mm. um, you know, for, for, for those young people. That's something mm. that I think the panel would would look at. Definitely. I was just checking with Raymond because quarter four, um, our quarter four data will, won't come till the next meeting, which is, I think, none of the dates are out yet for the next meetings, and I think probably be September time, I would think. I was going yeah. to say, in our world, it's sort of, I'm, I'm presenting it to, to um, Florence, etc. pretty soon, but I think, I think once it's maybe come in June, but it tends to be a long way down, uh, down the line. Um, yeah. But, but thank you for that anyway. Um, panel, do you have any more questions? Joe, as always, thank you very much for, for the report and, and all the information. Um, you know, you carry it and, and it's, it's really, really helpful. Um, so thank you on behalf of the panel. No more questions, that's lovely. So we can move on to the next item. On item number seven, um, elective home education, and I think I'm going to meet somebody new. This is lovely. So, Sharon and Gillian. Welcome, and Eva, Eva we know, yeah, that's nice. Um, just to say thank you very much for um, waiting through, through, <laughs> through all the proceedings beforehand. I hope you found some of it interesting and informative. Um, the way we work here is, is, you know, we don't expect you to read us back your report. Um, I like to think that there's possibly um, some positives that you would like to share with us that you feel are going really well um, and some issues that you would like to share with us. So we usually say, you know, two or three positives and perhaps two main glaring issues for you. So we're going to hand over to you to, to share with us your report, but to say thank you for the report anyway. Okay, thank you. Um... Right, I, well, I hadn't prepared two positive things over your issue, so sorry, I'm going to have to do what I've prepared. But um, I'm new, I started um, at the end of September in 2023, so the report actually is about the period beforehand. So as, as I'm going through, I'm going to talk about some of the things we've done um, since the report was written, I suppose. Um, one of the things uh, is about the context. So um, the home education lobby is very powerful in this country. Um, there has been a need for legislation for quite a long time because it was um, most of the reg legislation written around DHE um, was in the time when hardly anybody did it. So most boroughs had 20 to 30 families. And now we're looking at over 500, for example, in Greenwich. Um, there's no legal obligation for a register and anybody can home educate. So Ed Balls um, commissioned the Bad Man Report in 2009 and ever since then, um, successive governments, including the current one, have proposed legislation which has then been withdrawn after lots of opposition from the home education lobby. And most people, most people aren't really aware of that, but that's the case. Um, so there are hugely increasing numbers, not just um, in Greenwich, but everywhere. We've um, currently got 545 children who are home educated on our register. We've had 187 since September. Um, I've taken 107 people off since September as well. So I think that's quite... Um, a high number. Uh, we've got a net increase of 80. Um, lots of other boroughs are reporting huge increases, much bigger than in Greenwich, um, and a few London boroughs are reporting higher numbers than in the COVID years, which is actually quite surprising. So I think people are 
um, kind of wondering what's going on. Um, in terms of safeguarding, um, I have got a really good positive in that we've got no one now in EHE who's on a child protection plan, so that's good. Um, and we uh, prioritise cases where anybody is on a child in need plan or um, where social care have got an investigation going on. Um, EHE uh, are now invited to all the initial child protection conferences and where possible I attend and the same with uh, child in need conferences and we also feed back to social care so they're very much aware that I'm around and I'm prepared to get involved with cases. Um, with Gillian we're working with social care managers to make sure that all social workers are uh, much better informed about what EHE is and more importantly what it isn't because there's no monitoring, uh, routine monitoring around um, EHE. The government guidance is that you go for once a year if possible and review the education for up to an hour. So obviously the concern is most home educated children are invisible for most of the time. Um, and obviously with 545 cases and just me, I'm not going to be seeing all of them. Um, the other thing we've done is leaflets. I've done leaflets for health, um, for social care, for schools, as well as to parents to educate them again about what EHE is and what it isn't and to give them the proper guidance of what they should do. I'm working, well, Joe's team is helping us out because she, um, her team runs checks against uh, social care records so that if anybody's become um, a child in need or there's an investigation, we are alerted. So she does that once a month. And um, her team also matches um, the EHE register with the three census, the school census. And from doing that, we've identified lots of children who are dual registered, so we investigate and see where they are. Um, so we've been able to take a few kids off that way. Um, SEN, we've still got 15 people on an EHCP. Um, it is quite difficult because a, a lot of parents who have got um, EHCPs find it um, really difficult in school. They, they're not convinced that um, their child gets all the attention they need and it is very difficult with resources in school at the moment. And uh, especially in primary, some of them feel they're much better at home where they can spend a lot of time, especially if the EHCP is based around um, ASD needs and ADHD, the children get into trouble in school, so then they're in isolation, and so the parents would much rather take responsibility. Having said that, two of the best home educations I've ever seen were parents who had an EHCP, whose child had an EHCP. Um, we send now, um, since the report was written, we, I do a monthly... Um, check of all the children who we know who are SE, who have got an EHCP and I send it to the SEND team so that we can check that we've got the same names. Um, why are children, uh, how, why are people in Greenwich Home educating? Part of the problem is the schools are full, especially the secondaries. Um, that is where the bigger numbers are in secondary and um, even where there's spaces, parents want a choice we have people who, um, if they don't get their first choice school um, in secondary transfer, they will tend to just keep them at home for a long time. One of the things we're doing to combat that is to send out um, regular emails to the communities and say, and in, the, in our newsletter, we kind of mention, you know, some people can be waiting. I'm, I've got going to fact tomorrow with somebody who's been home educated, he's in year nine now, still on the waiting list for his first choice school, so that we get the message across, this is how long you could be waiting. And that does normally result in a few people saying, actually, can you help me get my child back into school? Uh, we've got no powers to refuse. Anybody can say they're home educating. That's a concern, but we need, um, MPs are aware of that. We need primary legislation to change that, apparently. Uh, and then all the things that the head teachers were saying about mental health, um, school refusal, avoiding prosecution, because Gillian's team's getting better, chasing around. <laughs> They're trying to avoid the consequences of um, prosecution and punishment. But also there's lots of people who are waiting for CAMS appointments. I've got some people who are waiting two years um, for ASD diagnosis, ADHD. 
We signpost, um, lots of Gillian's team work with children before they come to me, and we're always signposting all the um, things that are out there. There are the issues of the parents' mental health, so the wellbeing hubs we're signposting people to, and we're also encouraging schools. And I think schools are, a lot of schools are really doing everything they can to try and prevent EHE in the first place, but here we are. So. Well, thank you. Okay. That's great, Sharon. Um, Gillian, do you want to ask, do you want to add anything? Um, I was just going to add that one of the positives is actually employing Sharon in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> She's excellent at EHE officer, experience, mm -hmm. knowledge, it's, it's just been absolutely wonderful for our service. Um, I don't know, we mentioned about the um, interaction with the school nursing service, which has been yeah. a real positive, working with them to ensure that young people are receiving their vaccinations and health information. The EHE community is not very good at making sure that happens. So that's something we've been working with as well, which is a positive for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, an issue for all of us, I think, is that when you talk about elective home education, it, you're looking holistically at the child and all that, all the needs of that child, not just the fact that they're not in school, which actually does reinforce the belief that I have and that we heard from our head teachers, and I think we all share, that children are actually safer in school. Um, and, you know, because we know them, because they're there and we can help and we can monitor. Um, I'm struggling not to... Um, not to voice my own opinion on elective home education, so I'm going to pass on this. Um, the only thing that I, I, I'm not in agreement with is on figure 10, when it's, um, it, that there is this, um, oh, where am I, figure 10? There is this um, reasons for new EHE referrals, and... Um, there is a, the majority, the, there is this attitude that, that it's not down to any effects from the pandemic. Well, I would question that because I think if, if there's been a habit of being out of school for two years um, or being, uh, shall we say, not in the school building for two years, then I would think it becomes more um, obvious that, that it's, you know, it links in with all the mental health stuff that we've been talking about. It becomes more difficult for the child to get in there. Therefore, the parents lose confidence in the school system. And I, I, you know, I think that any increase, uh, you've got to take into account the fact that young people and families have been out of the school system for two years, really. So I would take issue with that. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, the... the the reasons, uh, the, we, we gather the reasons using, well, initially we were gathering the reasons using the um, list that the DfE gave us in the guidance for EHE officers, but then in the, gui in the um, collect document, which is where the DfE collect data from LAs, they actually came up with a different list, which is not very helpful. So um, we're kind of trying to juggle uh, the two DfE lists, and um, these are the reasons that people give but i would agree with you i mean you you know you can you can say that the but people aren't giving covid as a reason but i think i said i've said before that these these five reasons at the top are actually they cover really uh, i mean the i think m the vast majority of children that i have come across this year um, they could pick any one of those top five boxes because it's all the same thing. So I think I've said in the report people are saying uh, mental health, but a, um, a lot of people who've said it's philosophical or um, preferential, they don't really want to prefer to home educate. It's, they prefer to home educate than have their child stigmatised as having a mental health issue or as to go into court or paying a fine or um, to get bullied at school because they they think they've got ASD but they haven't got a diagnosis. So all of these five top reasons are actually the same thing. And I would have said the pandemic plays into that because people saw that you could have time off school and do a bit of online learning. And you know, as far as they're concerned, it wasn't a catastrophe. I think the trouble is, I think there is uh, building up a problem 
uh, nationally where people are staying at home for these reasons, but they're not thinking long term. So these children don't go to school because they're scared that they're going to get bullied or this is going to happen or that, or they're anxious or they don't want to get out of bed in the morning or the parent has lost control or whatever. But what happens when they're 16? And so some of the case um, uh, child protection conferences I've gone to are 16-year-olds who have not been out of the house for five years, haven't got any friends, haven't got an education, haven't got any... Um, social skills, how do they navigate all of those things if they're at home all the time? And so when I talk to a parent where one of these is the reasons, I do talk to them about that. And some, again, schools are being really flexible, but they are putting in place part-time timetables, uh, you know, late starts. So people are increasingly being flexible. I think this is a problem, and I think it is starting to be recognised by lots of teams in the local authority, and there's lots and lots of support out there. Um. Sharon, nevertheless, we've got 500 um, young people who are, you know, going to, they're going to, this, this is going to be their life, yeah. in fact. Well, we are trying to get, some of them are, do go back into school, and some people, obviously, I mean, we're kind of focusing on all the problem kids. There are kids who are, getting a very good home education, I'm sure, in the borough. There will be people, and they, they, they aren't just sitting at home. They are going out and they're meeting other home educated families and they're doing lots of things and it is flexible. As I said, the, you know, the, the, some of the best education I've seen is, is from pa parents who have got children with special needs, but they are going out of their way to make sure the child gets one-to-one -one attention, gets occupational therapy, meets other children. You know, they, there are some really good home educating parents. I don't want to paint it all as if all of these children are written off. You know, there are some great... Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to link um, figure 10 to figure um, 8. So you've got top five reasons why people are electing to homeschool. I know that last year, myself and Councillor Astley, we raised some questions and that's around the fact that have we explored to find out whether one of the reasons why parents are deciding to school their kids at home is because of religious reasons. Um, I know mental health and pandemic and all of that was, um, was one top reason way back then. But obviously, um, um, when you look at figure eight, um, figure eight has... Um, quite a high number, it's showing quite a high number of black, black Africans and also of white British. Have we explored, have we deep dived, have we interrogated the figures for philosophical or preferential reasons more to find out if there are, are religious reasons? And the reason why I ask this is because this is an opportunity for us as a borough to get into the faith communities and try to disabuse their mind about perceptions that they may have about some of the teachings that they feel have been introduced in the schools that are totally against their beliefs. Because I, I'm not seeing that being mentioned, but it is a reality. I mean, the community, and I hear that a lot. I don't want my children taught that. I don't want my children taught that. There's an opportunity here for us to engage with the faith communities, that is where we're able to find out that religion might be one of the reasons why some families or some parents are pulling their kids off from, from mainstream schools. Well, this is one of the reasons why we collect the reasons. Um, and to be fair, I think I've only had one case where um, religion was mentioned, and that was a family where they felt that they wanted to bring their children up in uh, the Islamic faith and they felt that schools didn't really recognise that um, in the way that they wanted. And I am aware that, um, well, I'm, I'm not so aware of it in Greenwich, but I know um, where I worked previously, there were a number of um, home educating groups of uh, Muslim families um, who had hired tutors and had very high aspirations um, which they felt isn't part of British culture. Um, 
And with those, it was quite tricky. So you have to build a relationship with them so that they can talk to you and you can talk to us. And it actually did work quite well in my previous borough where they, um, we, we made good relationships, some of the tutors. Um, and so they, they told us about some uh, practices going on in another uh, Muslim uh, school which then got shut down by the local authority but we wouldn't necessarily have got that inside information without building the trust but the only way you can do that is by getting out and working with the families and obviously uh, when I first started um, you know we had to put all of this stuff into place so we're not quite there yet in terms of really. but I, obviously when I'm working with families we do have these conversations. I think it would be really good if we can break that 21% down further just to try and find out how many are um, homeschooling because of religion or because of faith. And you've just given a great example of the reason why we need to engage with those cohorts because there are underhand practices going on. It's an opportunity for us to educate and make sure that our young ones are not being excluded for um, for whatever reasons their parents have decided to. So to really be very helpful to know so that we just break down that 21% further down. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The thing which comes very obviously from the report is that we're dealing with a leaking basket legally. So, so many of the rights of the parents are there which make it much make, make almost impossible at times to operate because they've just got the, oh, we're our own rights, we don't have to respond. So I can see this. Nevertheless, I can um, looking at the numbers on it, um, it seems to me that just one person, you've got a vast task and the numbers just don't add up um, in the sense of 526 children. There's a comment in, we couldn't uh, make a visit to every parent even in a year, and I should see probably every two to three years. And I just put this really to our chair. Is this something in the borough which is a problem and we ought to be putting it forward formally that there should be an increase in the staffing and the size of this department to cope with this problem? I put this as a, as a proposal to you. I think we'll minute that. <clears throat> strongly, Nick. And I think we would all, we would all like to see um, a few more Sharons. Yeah. Well, there we are. So, <laughs> Absolutely, uh, we would. Um, but I think you know it goes, it goes back to the old onion, doesn't it? We resourcing and um, re well, resourcing um, basically. Um, I think, but I think it's good for, the, for, for this panel to actually bring that to the notice. And I think we, you know, we, we recognise that 500 and more than 500 um, young people to be the responsibility of just one officer um, is, is not going to work. Um, you know, it is working, but it's, it's not going to be the best outcome. So, yes. We would, we would look for improvement. Could I just add a couple of other comments? I think probably um, different things on, uh, first of all, what Councillor Gwemi was saying. You've probably seen the legal uh, uh, case in the last couple of days about Muslim children and what was happening to them in school and that being forbidden to get together to pray. And I think this is something which uh, certainly needs to be rethought and challenged because these are important things. I think we're um, making sure that the rights of the children are really being taken away by um, rules like this. Um, I notice also the um, di different things about why children are not coming. I think it's um, not COVID illness now, but it's um, post-COVID. People see that parents are not going into work every day as they used to. Uh, five years ago, pre-COVID, mum and dad would be up getting everyone ready for school and they're rushing off to their work. Now parents are not getting up. They're just, um, they've got, they work at home and it's a, and children are saying, well, if, pa if my parents are not doing this, why should I bother to have to be thrown out of the home and get on the, the early bus to school? I think there's things like this are about and we really haven't got round them fully. Then there's also the question of the numbers which we picked up. And this, the curious thing is just the ratios. It's very helpful seeing the table, the percentages. But it's the, um, it's the uh, white ones uh, uh, seem to be highest 
And, and this is curious. I'm wondering, is it that these are parents who themselves are more highly educated and uh, have got the ability to do it? Or is it the other way around? Parents of just this particular group have lost interest in education and there are other things we know are happening that children are being um, asked to work in family business and things like this. And so are we able to do, dig down and see where, well, where these children are, are coming from? There's lots of things there. And then the other thing which I think is so important, it's so worthwhile, is to see how the network is being put together with um, looking to see if there are problems that, with uh, mental health and things like this, putting all together, contacts with doctor's surgeries and things like this. And it's, you can see the, what I said earlier on, the enormity of the task getting together to find the real problems with these young people. Yes, thanks, Nick. I, I just would, would come back on one of those things, and I would like to hopefully say, hand on heart, that um, the recent publicity about the school, um, I, I would not like to say that anything um, of that nature would ever happen in our authority. No, I mean, I think, you know, that's, that's very worrying, that there's a school that's not allowing... Uh, for equality to take place and for people to actually have and to pay respect for, um, for people's um, beliefs and religions. Because I know that we, you know, I know I did in my own primary school, always. Um, so I think, you know, I think we, it is something we should be aware of and it's something that I think, you know, we, we need as part of the conversation. But I don't think... I don't think we're blind in Greenwich, but I think we can honestly say our children have the opportunity to do as they as they would want to do and as they need to do during the day. I may I'm just I, I just wanted to say in terms of staffing, we do actually have um, an apprentice who is uh, doing the admin, some of the admin for us. So he helps us. Um, do the register. He adds people to the register and helps me take them off. So I have got um, an admin assistant who I, I definitely want him to get the credit. Bradley, fantastic apprentice. And we like the fact that he's an apprentice. Fantastic. That's really great. Well, I'm hoping eventually he'll be a member of staff because he's, he's, he's really keen and has really worked hard. And he started about a week after me, so we were kind of newbies together. Thank you very much, um, Sharon, Gillian, Eva, for, for coming um, in. Um, I think some of the questions I had have sort of been covered, um, but as it relates to some of the key drivers for, for this, is there also any part which is linked to some of the sort of rise in slightly more kooky and conspiratorial thinking among the among people out in the world and is that one driver where people are not wanting to send their kids to mainstream education due to eccentric views that they that they may well um have and as you noted i think it's important yeah, of course some homeschool provision will be exceptional lots of it won't and i guess the key challenge is that you know we don't have you don't have the capacity to properly ascertain that and you know while our schools have Ofsted over their shoulder 24 7 um, you know at most you can go in once a year for up to an hour and you know that seems a, a pretty stark contrast and very hard to manage the the, the quality of education um, provided um, so connected to that I guess are we able to track the educational outcomes of homeschool children or do we not get that data because they aren't in our schools, and so we don't know that. Um, and then also, uh, anything that we're able to get in terms of tracking some of the longer term outcome of those who are homeschooled in terms of future career prospects um, and so on. Because, you know, I think one could be homeschooled exceptionally well, but if some of the other sort of socialization that is so important when it comes to schooling isn't there, that may not, you know, one may not be able to fulfill their potential. Um, in quite the same way, and that might just be another way we can track it. But if we can't find that information out, then we can't find it out. <laughs> um, in terms of kooky views, 
I'm sure there are a few, but they, they, they don't quite phrase it to me like that. So we do have um, some people who say the education system isn't for us. And um, some of them have got a valid point in terms of schools are expecting everybody to do, you know, 10 GCSEs, regardless of um, ability, aptitude, desire, interest. Um, and they would much rather, um, say, do two or three GCSEs in one year. So they'll do English and maths, say, in year nine. And then they might go on to do science. And then they might do other things. Um, you know, it, so, so some of the genuine home educators, they are um, doing it for good reasons um, and uh, do object to the way that the sausage factory mentality, one size fits all, that they see as, as being the education system. Uh, but there are others who, who are just completely alternative. But I've, I haven't come across um, many so far. Um, in terms, I, I, would, I do want to make the distinction between the capacity and the government guidance. As I said, the home education lobby is extremely powerful, and it is they who have, um, they wrote, they helped to write um, the first set of government guidance, which was then replaced in 2019, but a lot of it is um, still around. Uh, so it's not necessarily capacity, so even if there were even if there were 10 of me, the recommendation from the government is still that you only go for once a year for an hour. Now, if you're a home, when the legislation was written, that, you know, there were 40 families, that, you know, that was probably fine. They were all doing it for kooky reasons or, or alternative lifestyle. Um, but now, my concern about that is more about safeguarding, because if you were, you know, going to abuse your child, that's the first thing you'd do. Because if you withdraw them from school, no one sees them, potentially. And obviously, that, it doesn't happen all the time. We haven't had any, touch wood, tempting fate, terrible disasters in, in Greenwich. But it does happen, um, as well as the whole education thing. Um, and as I said, the, you know, the uh, bad man report recommended all this was dealt with. And every time it gets anywhere near to being legislated against, there's a huge fuss and it gets dropped. Um, so it was dropped in December 2022, most recently. So the capacity issue is one thing, but uh, the, um, as I said, that is guidance as well. In terms of outcomes, we don't get to find out. I have started to write um, in my newsletters, and we, we're trying to engage families. And we have started to get a few families who write back when we do an email out, um, saying, please tell us how you get on. Tell us whether you pass your GCSEs. If you're taking them early, let us know recommend any tutors or ways to do it, things like that. But they, t they do, the, there is a part of the home educating community which is suspicious and they, they are a bit reluctant to tell us things like that. In terms of, um, I, I, most of the parents I've spoken to about outcomes, they're talking about going to do their GCSEs post 16 at college. And it is, again, for that flexibility. So I'll do English and maths, and then I'm going to do childcare. Or I'm English and maths, and I'm going to do construction and things like that. Um, but we do have um, Simon Connolly is our um, careers practitioner. And um, one of the first people who contacted me when I started, he asked me for the list. And he goes out and makes contact with all the year 11s year 11 parents and he's been working with them all year he's just done another so at the start of each term he contacts me and so he's just done another reach out to them how are you doing are you on track have you made your application and all the rest of it and he also said that soon he'll be asking me for year nines with an ehcp so he works with those family as well and so he tries to track them as well so we've sort of got a double pronged approach trying to catch the and prevent needs I think we would like to say thank you for this, Sharon. What I, what I would like to add is um, it smacks of a lack of confidence or a lack of knowledge of what's going on within schools sometimes. And that's why um, the lobby is so strong. And I think we've, we've spoken in this panel before with officers about celebrating our schools, our secondary schools and our primary schools and providing a platform so that people and families absolutely understand what's available, understand what's going on, so that it's up front. And, I mean, we do have our booklets and we do have our, our information 
gathering, but to actually celebrate and, and you know, make it up front. I think then the confidence um, for schools might increase. I mean, uh, so I would just float that one out there because I think that's something we will monitor as time goes on, that, that you know, we push out there that the schools... Because, I mean, I'm of the firm conviction that children are safer in school as a whole. Um, otherwise, it's a worry. Sharon, thank you very much for your first report to us. Um, and I'm sure the panel is very grateful. Gillian, Sharon, and Eva, thank you. We, we haven't asked you anything, Eva, but you, do, you did your report before anyway, so thank you. Thanks very much. If, if there's nothing else, we can move to the next item, yeah? Excellent. So we're on to item eight, children missing education. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Gillian. All right. And there was me thinking I had a really loud voice. <laughs> um, okay, so a major challenge for us for children missing education um, is mobility and the temporary housing issue, which has already been raised um, across other reports. Um, so we do have a high number of uh, families moving into the area, and then with the lack of um, some school places, specifically secondary, we don't um, necessarily... Um, enable them to get into school straight away but there's a lot of work done in um, tracking them and making sure that they're making applications and that they're actually enabled to get into schools. Um, with the temporary housing issue we have a lot of families being moved out of the borough and that becomes then an attendance issue and a potential CME issue which again we try and track them and make sure that we don't lose sight of them and the positive of that is that a lot of families want to come back to Greenwich um, if they're moved out. So they want to remain in the schools that they're in in Greenwich. So they are actually prepared to travel back to Greenwich to those schools. Um, and a part of the positive is a lot of our schools are very innovative in the way that they actually support those families. Some schools, one school in particular, has a um, washing machine, etc. And they allow those parents, if they're in a travel lodge, which is unfortunately something that housing have had to use, um, to wash the clothes of the, the, the families while they're in, in London, travelling up from Gravesend, etc. Um, or for the families to be able to have showers and things like that within the school. So it's been really heartening that the schools have actually thought outside the box, how can they support families in that way? And this has meant that... Once those families are, you know, back in, in, in Greenwich, they're then accommodated, they're no longer, you know, not necessarily CMEs. So our purpose is if, they're, if we're holding on to them via our schools or we're keeping track of them, then, you know, we're happy and they're not becoming CMEs. We're working with our temporary housing um, colleagues um, in tracking the families. So some of these families are moving from one travel lodge or another travel lodge to another travel lodge, Gravesend, Merton, Midway, and they can be lost in the system. But again, we're, we're as I say, working positively with um, housing to track them to make sure that if they permanently remain where they are, which they could be in temporary for two, five years, etc. Um, that we're actually keeping track of them and then helping them get onto a role of another school if they can um, and then, you know, one freeing up school places but also we know that they're safely somewhere else in another borough. So it's a massive challenge but actually there's some positives that have come out of it as well for that. Um, I think one of the not so positives is that the... Um, children missing education legislation is from 2016, so it hasn't been updated um, at all. However, the working together to improve school attendance, which we're all working under, 
um, becomes statutory in August of this year. And through that process, we've been undertaking lots of forums, staff briefings, training with our schools, as was our plan in the report. And we've actually um, undertaken those training, that training through the forums for all of our schools. And it's included CME and EHE, reminding schools of their responsibilities um, and, and all that kind of thing. So that, again, is, is helping us to get the word out there of the things that schools should be doing when they're faced with a potential CME. Um, and it feeds also into the early help and prevent, prevention strategy that we have. And, and um, it's not only helping with the attendance of all our schools and actually um, feeds into other things we were talking about tonight, the parenting strategy, the support that's out there for parents. We're trying to gather all that together so that we've, we're actually you know, empowering the schools to have these prevention and intervention in place. And if they've got a family that are potentially CMEs, they're potentially going to move away, um, disappear, they're actually working with them first, trying to get information out for them, trying to track them at really early stages rather than, oh, they haven't been here for 20 days, they're a CME and just taking them off roll. So again, that training, that message and being very clear with schools about what their responsibilities are, um, and, you know, again, that is another positive for us. Um, Positive, the collaborative working that, you know, through the prevention strategy, you know, we're really getting a lot of um, collaboration with other agencies, voluntary services, directorates, um, that we're able to actually work across all of those. Prevention being, you know, as I say, schools working with families at very early stages to, to prevent them from coming to CMEs. Um, yeah, so uh, we, through our reorganisation, um, my colleague, who's failed to come up here, um, um, is actually <laughs> taken over the CME lead officer role, and she's very good at challenging schools um, on, you know, what are they actually doing to prevent CME, um, and working with our SEND colleagues as well. So, you know, that to me has been a positive as well. Um, we also are using study bugs, which is another positive. Um, under the new legislation, um, all schools must give us access to their registers, which is a real bonus um, when we're trying to track young people. Um, and we have um, commissioned study bugs. I can't remember why we're calling it study bugs, but um, it's actually a live, a live registration. So we can, from our from the Woolwich Centre, from our desks, actually look at live data from schools for registration, children going on roll, going off roll, etc., which, as I say, has been a real bonus to us. We've got 90% of the schools across Greenwich who are using that system. C can I just ask, sorry to interrupt, Jill, um, amongst all this, that's all schools, including academies, free, free school? All schools, including independent schools, must inform the local authority of, you know, enable access to their registers. Um, it's a challenge because, you know, one, you know, they don't necessarily want to follow the guidance. They want to follow, what, you know, their guidance. And also, they don't necessarily want us to have access to their registers. Um, but it's, again, it's something that we are um, offering out there where... We've had forums, as I say, and we're actually planning forums right up to the end of this academic year where we're just going to do teams meetings and just trying to get into these in, um, academies and independent schools to get the word across about how they should be managing, you know, non-attendance that could lead to CME, that kind of thing. I... I... I don't know where to start, really. I mean, it's a, it's a huge job, isn't it? And Florence, Florence. Uh, the new responsibilities on the local authority are just as Gillian has explained, that we now have responsibility for independent schools, academies, all of those. There's no additional resourcing whatsoever, no additional funding to do this work, nothing whatsoever. So we're fortunate to have such a great team uh, with Ava and Gillian and their, their colleagues that we can undertake that work, but there is actually no additional resource to do this. 
Well, I wish we had some, Florence, is all I can say. I mean, along with all the challenges that is the picture of tracking down children, there is that multiple challenge of there being no resources to support it. And, you know, when you actually hear of families living in uh, temporary accommodation and hotels and trying to educate their children, it, it is heartbreaking. Um, and we want to see that improved. That's, that's the challenge. Um, but what I've heard is, you know, how, how much hard work is going on. Um, I just wanted to make, um, make a few comments, really, just to say that I was really impressed in this report about the multi-agency links. It was huge, the, 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 you know, the, the, the links that you're using to actually check on and monitor and make sure you've got access to it. So it's the blue, all the blue stuff. Yeah, it was blue on mine. That's really good. Um, and, I, you know, the big question is, is what Florence says, do we have this, do we have the resources and the capacity to maintain that? You know, it's because I don't know about anybody else, but I don't, don't see this getting any less. Um, over time, I think this is here to stay for some time because housing, housing can't be resolved, uh, um, you know, overnight. So you know, it's about the capacity, isn't it? So we don't, we are talking about resourcing and capacity there. The other thing that I commented on was um, in the data on Figure Five, you you had uh, information on um, young yeah, children that are non non-statutory school age and that for me is you know something that I think should be commended because that's really hard information to get but you, you know you had that there so thank you for that that's that's really good um, and I suppose the concern is about as Nick was saying in the earlier report about the British the white British and European are the largest you know community for missing education and I just wondered if there's anything, you know, that might help. I don't know with this, and I don't know if I don't know if we have got anything. But if, you know, if there's anything that you could think of that might help to support um, this group. Uh, yeah, we, we've um, been talking about how are we going to get, you know, into that kind of group. Um, we have started links with. Um, the, the um, gypsy um, traveler community to try and get, you know, to, to work with them. And we've actually, through um, my colleagues Caroline and um, Sharon, been meeting with um, the traveler community liaison officer. And, and he, he highlighted a couple of young people that um, were out of school. So through that process, we've kind of got some meetings together discussing those um, young people. And uh, I think it's St. Joseph's, which is the, the school in Ch Charlton down that way. Um, and the head teacher there has been wonderful about, you know, helping accommodating the secondary school pupils to actually go in um, and, and, you know, um, complete application forms and things like that. Just trying to be hel as helpful as possible. Um, and it's, you know, just using that kind of link and, and work with those communities. So we are trying to build that, that up now. Any questions? Yeah, Callum, yeah. So thank you uh, very much. Sort of three quick questions. I'll do them all at once, just to save time. Um, the multi-agency stuff is fantastic, uh, and I think the comments you made about housing, that's really promising, uh, really positive. How proactive have you found housing, though, in flagging that, or is it something you have to chase? Um, and how sort of systematic are we that whenever a family goes into temporary accommodation out of borough, we make sure we track and have information on any kids who are in our schools so that we can follow up to engage and hopefully make your life a little bit um, easier. Um, kind of linked to that, if we have young people who are in temporary accommodation, particularly if it's quite far out of the borough, are we able to support schools in providing any sort of online learning as a way of maintaining continuity, for example? Um, you know, we have some of the tech from COVID. It obviously wasn't perfect, but it's probably better than no form of education at all. Um, and lastly, how much of a priority, you kind of touched on this um, before as well, do we think this is for schools, i.e. I can imagine that 
there may be some pupils whose schools are perhaps less enthusiastic about tracing to try and get them to come back into school if they're disruptive and while one can understand that from the school's perspective and perhaps from that of other classmates who are subject to disruption and this perhaps comes on to our next agenda item a little bit as well um, it is nonetheless their job to make sure that they're serving every every child under their duty of care I can't remember what your first question was to be fair <laughs> uh, yeah sorry how proactive housing are okay we? I think um, it, all, not all of a sudden, but it, it became quite an issue when we were talking about attendance and things like that, and, and we all kind of jointly um, were flagging up these issues with temporary housing and the impact it was having on young people, um, families and young people, and, and housing actually became very proactive, I think, in, in assisting us um, with and, and then acknowledgement of the amount of young people that were the children that were impacted by moving the parents because in housing they weren't thinking about the impact of education um, you know so they were just a, a roof is needed over the head of this family so we're going to move them there and not actually thinking about the fallout of all of that so uh, I think once they were thinking about all of that we um, at what we were saying was becoming more real to them we um, things like um, if they're in a travel lodge they can't get access to the um, internet unless they pay something like three pound a day. And our suggestion to housing was, well, part of what you pay the travel lodge, can't you pay for our families to have access to the internet? Because a lot of families have got phones and stuff like that that they can actually access some information. And then if they can, the schools can give them some online learning. So it was like that knock-on effect that, that was happening. Can I add something? Um, so Onda, my colleague, uh, recently set up a, a partnership board between housing and so, um, social care children's services that now meets regularly. It's been amazing, hasn't it, in terms of um, uh, the shift and uh, the, the directorates really communicating and, and, and understanding better than ever. And also Sean, who's the assistant director um, who has the responsibility around families in temporary accommodation, etc. Uh, he's made a request. He's going to come to our next head partnerships, heads partnership meeting, which is in two weeks' time, to explain this, the situation to head teachers and also um, answer questions. He, he really wants to engage with schools as well. So it's a, it's a really positive picture. Well, big shout out to Anda for you know that that that's a real real move forward and you know i for one would like to see much more in terms of linking like this because we're looking at families holistically aren't we we you know it's and because so we've got health housing education all linked together sorry i'm digressing this is not a <laughs> but it's yeah yeah so the sort of kind of two other bits one which I think you've kind of answered already Gillian about online learning and I'm guessing implicit in that is yes that is something that we are supporting and encouraging schools to do when kids are in temporary accommodation um, and then just on the priority schools are giving to it um, and I guess anything we're doing to sort of give them a, a gentle so, nudge as absolutely it's a priority for all schools and it's certainly the the number one priority for the DfE they've recognized you know across the country that attendance is really low, so it's an absolute priority. I think all of our schools are bought into trying to improve attendance, and part of the wellbeing hubs is using the lens of attendance to identify and understand where there are persistent absence, where there's something that's happening in the family home that's really stuck, be it mental health, be it wellbeing, be it anxiety, and do that bridging work between the family home and the school to improve attendance and also then improve mental health, wellbeing, and a whole range of other factors. So I think our schools are bought into that. I think the, uh, the kind of proactive action of getting everybody signed into uh, the uh, study, study bugs, um, I was going to say Wandle because that's the DfE. So that just confusingly for everybody, the DfE have one commissioned uh, provider, Wandle, and many local authorities, us included, use something which is much easier to use. So schools do have to do both, but our direct feed is study bugs. So um, just the fact that so many of those have signed up to those two systems and our individual local authority one, I think shows me that they're, they're committed to improving attendance. 
Thank you very much for the report. Um, it's great to hear that schools are being empathetic enough. Um, it would be great if that can be spread across most schools. I do understand that there's a funding um, element to it and also space as well, but it's, that's an absolute great best practice that should be shared across the board. My little comment is on figure six and figure five. Is it possible next time when you're doing this data not to use this format? Because I'm actually struggling to pick in the numbers for, um, to pick in the numbers, for example, Chinese, I don't know whether it's 23 or 213. Yes, if we could just use another format next time so that we can pick the exact figures out. So I can't, it's difficult for me to even interrogate the data because of the way it's been done. Thank you, thank you. Okay, well, there are no more questions. I just would like to say a big thank you, Gillian, for, uh, for, for the work and for the report. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, so we're not here to pick holes in anything. We're looking for recommendations as well. So thank you very much. We're now going to move on to item nine, which is our exclusions, suspensions and exclusions, which I think is almost the same people. <laughs> I, I just wanted, before we left, sorry, I meant to say, before we left Gillian's report, the CME report, um, I trust um, that the panel had a chance to read the case study at the end and the amazing comments from Ofsted around that. Um, so, you know, warmest congratulations for that. Uh, but the case study was just amazing. It's just very thorough. Anyway, move on to... Item number nine, exclusions. Um, are we looking at Eva? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, all. Um, so the, the Fair Access Panel Suspensions and Exclusions Report, I really feel for future, I almost feel like it needs to be turned on its head and be called an inclusion report because it really, this report is quite long, and apologies, colleagues, but it's, it's, it tries to encapsulate everything that the inclusion and the inclusive services do and working with other services to support children and families and the schools that we serve. So really, on a strength-based approach, it's really around the work of the inclusion. So that's our primary and secondary inclusion team. That's our attendance advisory service, uh, which Gillian and Sharon are part of. Um, it's also having an officer from the Youth Justice Service who supports us um, as well with education cases. So it encompasses, and the virtual school as well. So um, a strength-based really is, I think it's, I've highlighted it in section 4.4 in page 110, is our extended use in the virtual school. So we're not only supporting children in care, we're working to support vulnerable learners across those known to social care and youth justice service. Um, and this is a joint role, which means we've got over 50 staff dedicated across five service areas to the work of championing children. So I just think that is, again, it's one of our strengths within our local authority. And if I look, and I meet very closely with Pan London colleagues who oversee inclusion and, and support of exclusions within the local authority, we have a really robust offer in terms of our services around supporting children, particularly who might be out of school or at risk of exclusion. So this report really covers children who could have emotional school avoidance and might not be attending school. It can cover children who might have medical needs and may need and who may be out of school and also those who are at risk of exclusion. So, um, and have a lot of, um, let's say, protective characteristics that kind of have the additional um, intersectionality of needs that make it very difficult for them and their families to be able to really sometimes engage. Um, Another positive, I just want to, there was, we put the quote in there from the send offset inspection, which is on, which is in section 4.6 on page uh, 111, but leaders and practitioners involved in the fair access panel and behavioural support services take a child focused approach. They work closely with schools and other partners to do the right thing for each individual and their family. They deal with some challenging situation and persist until there is a positive outcome. They find creative and innovative ways to do the right thing for a child or young person. And I think that covers the, t the service that the teams work so hard to do. So I think that's a real, real positive. Um, our, we work really collaboratively with, with, across children's services. And that's, again, another one of our strengths that we work so well. And we're very lucky to have the colleagues that we have across social care and FAS services. Um, 
in terms of referencing around exclusions. So exclusion data is time lagged, so we don't, we have the data from 21-22 based on when this report was written. Um, I just want to say to, to this panel, there are no exclusions for primary age children. So in 22-23, we've had none. There was one issued and we had it rescinded, so that didn't go through. We always look at alternatives and find positive outcomes for the children. And we support the families, most importantly, so the parents and the carers understand their rights. Um, and we look at in terms of access arrangements as well. So when we have parents whose uh, language, English isn't their first language, we make sure that we invest in translators and we, we push that back to schools and make sure that they are communicating effectively with the parents and, um, and carers. Um, in terms of suspensions, there has been an increase in 21-22 compared to 2021, um, which is in line with the national trend where both England and London suspension rates have also increased. Um, in terms of characteristics, for primary age children, it's children with VHE and SEND support. They have a higher suspension rate. The suspension rates of missing ethnicity children, and, and in particular boys, are also higher than the average suspension rate for the borough. Uh, the Greenwich suspension rate in all these categories remains lower than the national comparators. Um, in terms of secondary, second exclusion rates for Greenwich uh, in 21-22 was 0 0.06 and significantly below Link England at 0 0.16, but slightly higher than London at 0 0.09%. Secondary suspension rates for Royal Greenwich were 11.22, which is lower compared to the rest of England, but higher than most London authorities. The suspension rate in Royal Greenwich secondary schools increased compared to last year, which is 2021, so in 21-22. Um, and this was not as high as the national increase in England, which was 5.48%. Um, characteristics, again, of secondary age children, um, so it's young people with any HP or, or SEND support have higher suspension rates. Pupils who are eligible for free school meals, boys and white ethnicity are also higher suspension rates than the borough average. Um, in terms of exclusions, we had 11 exclusions in 21-22. Um, the most common reason was physical assault against a pupil, which accounted for four of those. Nine of the exclusions were males and two were females. Six had SEND support. White British young people were the most excluded ethnic group, accounting for seven of the 11. The inclusion service is paramount in circumnavigating exclusions and suspensions. Of the 64 exclusion notifications we received, so in our inbox we got 64 saying we're going to permanently exclude this child, only 11 and obviously 11 too many, but still, you know, that's 53 that have been prevented. And that is down to the uh, such hard work and amazing working relationships we have with school. Stuart was sitting here and he mentioned about five children having taken and been affected by THC. Most heads would have just excluded all those children. Not one of those girls were suspended or excluded. So just, just to say they had something else. Um, there were... There was movement, but no exclusion. So we're not dealing, we're trying to really support our schools. We've not been punitive, looking at the safeguarding risks rather than the actual, um, rather than the actual behaviour, if that makes sense, you know, looking at what's behind the behaviours. So, I mean, you know, testament to Stuart. And Tom, who was sitting next to him, you know, holds two of some of our most, you know, children with some complex needs, one particularly in care, and that school have never excluded that child in terms of if you think a threshold, they work so hard with us. So, I mean, that was just testament of two schools. I could give you a story for all of our schools. So um, that's really positive. In terms of FAP, um, I'm gonna keep this bit quite brief. Due to the admissions code in 20, September 2021 having changed, there's been a, a real decline in number of FAP cases. So FAP, we use the Fair Access Panel to get children back in school when there is no other option through the in-year admissions. Um, and secondary cases remain higher because there's more complexity in secondary and there are no secondary spaces where primary there's lots of, there's reduced PAN. So there's primary, it's much easier to place the children. In secondary, we've still got ch schools continually going over PAN and again, working with us to try and get those children back into school. Um, and, and due to the needs of children as they get older, you see more cases of children being brought to FAP to prevent exclusion. So again, using FAP to kind of support and make sure children remain in education, which is the primary function of FAP. Um, and we have excellent partnership and collaboration with our schools at FAP. Um, there's another section from 4.29 on page 122, which lists the support that we provide in the inclusion service for primary schools. We have BSPs, behaviour support practitioners, who support our schools and offer support. We have an outreach service. We have alternative provision for primary. We have two different alternative provisions for primary. 
Um, and in section 4.35, it talks a little bit about the transition to support children from primary to secondary and all the additional resources that we have in our secondary team um, to support with a summer school programme up called Stepping Up. Uh, we've got allocated transition mentors who work with year sixes and then into and work them with year sevens. And we also have reintegration officers allocated to every secondary school working with our most at-risk children for exclusion. Um, so this is a really enhanced support to our secondary schools. Um, next steps. So we've set up our, an alternative provision working in partnership with New Haven, our PRU, and Charlton Athletic Community Trust. So this is, a, this is for secondary children, it's up to 16 spaces. It's just opened. We're going to hopefully have a launch event, but this is to provide and to stop children being in tuition in, in libraries, but actually have access to food, have access to some sport, some pastoral support. So this is, again, meeting the needs of our local, with all our local needs of children. Um, we've been implementing, we've got a Safe Hands initiative, which is looking at alternatives to exclusion when a child has brought in a, uh, an offensive weapon into school and looking at how, again, not being punitive, looking at it from a safeguarding point of view, much like that example with the, with the, the substances. Um, we've also implemented a Manage Move guidance, and that is worked in partnership with our Assistant Director Vicky and also our schools to kind of make sure if children are moving to schools that we're monitoring them and we're tracking them, and there is specific guidance on how to support the children. It's not they have this other chance moving to a new school. What support is that new school doing? What is the home school doing to support that move? So um, that's been something else that we... Is, is already in motion, has already happened. We've done our actions, which I've said that we're doing. Um, we've got medical guidance, again, supporting children who might be emotional-based school avoidance. Um, we've developed a chill hub, which is two hours of um, kind of drop-in session with three practitioners in the inclusion service and our EP service. Um, so children can, who have not been to school for at least four weeks can attend their weekly in term time. Um, we're also in talks with Shooters Hill College to, put, to set up a 14 to 16 provision in September for EBSA type children who then might also be linked with our elective home education cohort. So we're really thinking about how to support our children and developing also inclusion practice. So we've got an inclusion event in October um, because that's part of it is keeping our children in our schools and supporting our schools. And I made note that um, somebody mentioned about what support is there for teaching staff I think it was you, councillor. Um, and we're also investing in some post-COVID um, training for teachers around what supports them. So we've commissioned a provider who's doing some, who's putting together some material because there was all the post-recovery for, for children, but there was nothing for the teachers and teaching staff as well. Sorry, not just the teachers. So there's lots of things happening, um, but they were the key things that I feel was really important. Um, and also working with the Education Against Racism group, that's another thing. So I sit on the Tackling Structural Racism group within the local authority, but I'm also supporting in the Education Against Racism and seeing what else we can do to kind of break those inequalities and, and support our children who are most at risk. So, yeah, in a nutshell. Thank you. Eva. Follow that. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. I mean, you must be very proud of this i mean this is a very um well, it's a very wide-ranging report and covers all the bases um i am really familiar with the fair access panel having been through it a few times what i but it's obviously different um nowadays um what i maybe this is an obvious question but for for the purposes of the panel the Fair Access Panel, um, does that include all our schools, all the schools that are in Greenwich, including academies and including, you know, so that, you know, everyone has to take, we used to say, take your first share sort of thing. So for secondary, we have a representative from every secondary school. Um, we have one independent school there, but, and, all the, and there's other independent schools that don't attend. But in terms of our um, academies and maintained schools, they are all there for secondary. So, and then they're the cases. So there is real challenge. They are a great group in terms of challenging each other and being part of the process. So, you know, we don't do to them. They tell us what needs to be changed, and we try and support with those conversations. So in terms of distribution, there is that real... Um, challenge from each one another around that. So we just facilitate effectively, if that makes sense. So it's all schools, it's not, you know, we're not just looking at the Greenwich family of schools, that's, that's great. Um, 
Uh, oh no, that's the wrong place. Uh, I mean, I just think with all this work, my observation was, and, and I'll open it for questions um, to the panel, but um, as a whole, the exclusions and, and, and suspensions are lower um, in Greenwich than, than anywhere else. And, um, you know, I mean, there obviously, we don't, one child excluded is, is one too many, but, um, and one child suspended, but, but obviously, something is, is working right in Greenwich. Um, so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is a report for us to digest, and this is a report for us to refer to and to commend and to monitor that this is what, this is sustainable, that this is what's happening. So thank you for this. I'll open for questions now for panel. Thank you uh, very much. So kind of quickly, I mean, I, I think it's really positive that the attitude is to first look at things from a safeguarding perspective. Um, before then looking at a more punitive approach. Of course, not every suspension or exclusion is a failure. Sometimes a suspension can completely transform a kid's attitude, and sometimes the only option is to exclude for the sake of other kids. But I think it's really good that we have that safeguarding first um, approach. Um, and I mean, the tick up in suspension rates, one is probably not as much of a surprise given that's the first full post COVID year. And so, you know, you can imagine there are going to be more issues there. And so I don't think that is something that would be a, a big matter of, of kind of huge concern. Um, I think the thing that's most striking is the number of EHCP um, and SEM provision kids who are subject to exclusions. Um, and I guess the kind of question is to what extent do you think that this is a symptom of mainstream schools having to essentially uh, plug the gap in SEM support and make up for pretty woeful lack of support from central government for our schools when it comes to proper send provision um, versus to what extent there are things that we could be doing differently. Um, I think I think Florence has already alluded in terms of budgets as well, and there is a real issue around retention of staff, so staff, support staff in particular, who are the crux in terms of keeping some of those children who bubble up in the classroom in a more calm in a more calm place um you know that's a real issue so i think that is until there's a, a, a change and we're seeing schools were having to cut their budgets you know cut the senko role or cut three tas and then they're still trying to meet the legal obligation of a, an ehcp so there's that and there's obviously the shortage of SEM provision but i mean that's a national thing but as a local authority Florence, Vicky are very committed into supporting with what we can and looking creatively around our provision. So we are listening to our schools. We're not just sitting here saying, oh, yeah, it's terrible. And the fact is, it's, it's, you know, it's the round hole and square, the square peg in the round hole. Not every young person is going to manage to go into mainstream and fit in, but they might not need a plan either. You know, they might just need something a bit more bespoke. So I think that's about us creating provision, you know, vocational opportunities, that exploring things with Shooters Hill, LSEC. That's what I'm hoping will help our schools have more options, but to still hold that child. So once that child comes into their school, it's their child for life. That's what we'd like pie in the sky is that they don't exclude, but they just look at alternatives and still keep that child part of their community. So that's, I think, our ambition and goal. I'd add that you're right there in terms of um, what you said. So Greenwich is Greenwich schools are historically incredibly inclusive. It's why I've stayed in the borough for so long. Our inclusion services are, are incredible. And someone said, can we have more Sharons? I'd love more Avers. <laughs> um, she, she, she leads that service, I'm sure you, you can imagine. But it, what's happening recently, and I know you're aware of this, is that the, the, the need is increasing, the numbers of children with complex needs, and that because of funding, the provision isn't there. And our inclusive, historically inclusive schools who still have their, their they're, they're bursting at the seams and they're struggling to manage the need that they're, they're being asked to. And, and that's, that contributes to, to those statistics. So we are increasing the DSP are. provision, which you're, you're leading. Yeah. So we're increasing that. We do have in the pipeline new school opening, Hargood Road. Yeah. Uh, we're in the process of identifying a primary site. So there will be more provision. That's been planned for a couple of years and that's in the pipeline. But the DSP provision is important. We're also reviewing our banding uh, process to try and give schools more funding for children with special education needs. 
um, and increasing the banding to recognise those children who should be in a special school but there's no place for them and giving the schools more, more funding for that. What we want to try and avoid is an increase of independent schools that are out of the borough, that are not as good provision um, and, to try, and it costs a huge amount of money. So we would prefer our inclusive schools that are local to hold those children well and decrease the number of independent schools. So we've got a kind of long-term strategy about sort of how we increase our provision and decrease the use of independent schools. Yeah, go on, Joe. Yeah. Um, just to add to this, I just think for context, and this isn't, you know, government bashing, but it's really interesting and reflective that um, for as many years as I care to remember, we every year, Florence will know well because she has to formally sign off, have to do what's called the SCAP return, which is our sort of sufficiency and capacity assessment in terms of our school places. Um, only last year, which was kind of a pilot year in this year, um, is the DfE now looking at that through the lens of SEND? So I think that's quite telling. And I appreciate why, because they know it's a very complex thing and what they don't want to do, bearing in mind there's, there's fewer of us to do the work, is create a bureaucracy and burden on us, which is precisely what it's done, but we're sort of sucking it up and sort of going, it's for the greater good. Um, but this will only be the second year where we're being asked to actually do any sort of um, lens around our sufficiency in the context of SEND and what they're trying to unpick and we hope for the right reasons is us being able to say yes this is what we've got but trying to differentiate between what we think is a pressure because of just pressure in the system versus this is the pressure where we physically cannot accommodate these children locally and we are we are having to send them miles for the right reasons for that child's education but it's not our aspiration so I think it's just interesting to go our aspiration and our hope would be that will lead to more equitable funding for those authorities that are particularly pinched by that. We're all feeling the strain of more children, but certain bits of the country are feeling the strain, I think, more greatly around lack of local provision. Um, so our hope is it won't come any time soon. Whether there's a change of government, at least that would stay. It's a trajectory so that the, the high needs block is more reflective of the true position just not what some of our numbers say. And there's an assumption, well, if you've got more, it's kind of spread equity, so you can have a little bit more. Um, so I just thought for context, that's the government trying to play catch up on what we've been struggling for years. Thanks, Eva, and thanks again for this. Um, this is a question more so as a for my benefit and my understanding. So from looking at the report and trying to understand it a little bit more, there is a, perhaps a suggestion that inclusions or suspensions may rise. Okay, and then if we are to look at then how we really could solve this issue, being mindful of the reduction in resources, um, the increase in the amount of students that we are taking, what would that real, real be? What would be the, the solution? I'm just trying to, you know, figure it out in my head. <laughs> um, so if I just think two years ago, we didn't have the resources that we have now in the inclusion service. We had some of those resources, but just in terms of EHE, we have now an apprentice. So that's a full-time person supporting our EHE officer. In terms of secondary inclusion, we have assigned people to do specific works like alternative provision, quality assurance, that's working in partnership with SEND. So I think we're very joined up and I think there was always a lot of good join up within the children's services, but I think we've become even more joined up. So that is gonna be helpful. Um, and I think the resources we've got at the moment are building up, um, are building up in order to support our schools. So it's not a complete solution, but what it is is we have got more resources now Council than we had two years ago. So we've been very fortunate and been supported by, you know, Florence as in terms of some of the funding also that we've received to support our school. So we haven't reduced the funding in our department. In fact, it's been increased in, in line with that need. So that was recognised, the need we, we were listened to in terms of, you know, and in terms of attendance, it's all been listened to. We've had additional officers to support us. So the idea is really to try and show the impact, support the schools, listen to the schools, and then try and maintain that with the budgets and, you know, um, that we have. And hopefully, 
if there is a change of government, there might be a change of funding and vision and will help our schools. I think that's to be commended because I think that, that reflects exactly this local authority's, um, shall we say, um, belief that if, unless you get unless you get the special needs and exclusions and the fundamentals right, then you're storing up difficulties further down the line. So it's, you're going to meet it anyway. So, you know, that's really heartening to hear that our focus is in the right place, you know, to actually make those baselines work so that later on in life um, those people are more secure. I don't have any more questions about this, except that, you know, that we could go on debating this for a long, long time, but we're not going to, because we've been here a long time. I just would like to say a huge big thank you, Eva, and Florence, and Vicky, and Joe, and Carl, who's been sitting there all this time. It's been one of our longest ever meetings. We've never had one this long before, but... It, it, we've covered a lot of ground. We have. And um, very enjoyable, if I might say so. So take care. And I think this is our last one of this, this particular section. Um, and we will be seeing each other again soon. All right? Lots of business going on. Yes. Linda, thank you for chairing the scrutiny so well. And it's, it really makes a difference to us because it is always... A learning process we talk about it afterwards we think about how we can do something differently how we can improve the reports and your feedback all of yours but your chairing and commitment to children we've all really appreciated and thank you yeah. thanks ever so much we've got a great panel thank well, you florence yeah. and sammy i'm sure yes. you'll continue in, yeah. in that way. thanks ever so much yeah. and you know thank you for all the hard work for our children fantastic take care everybody